Well, hello and good morning. It's an honor for me to be here this morning with all of you here at DevOx because this is obviously the greatest conference for developers there is globally. And if you don't feel that way, I actually know this to be true because I see all the different conferences around the globe. So this is one of the longest standing, one of the uh, highest quality developer conferences out there in the market. So kudos to you guys to, uh, for being here today and of course, buying your tickets before it all sells out. Now we have a lot of ground to cover today. I tend to talk really fast. I'll try not to talk too fast. But we have easily four or five hours of things to talk about, uh, but we're kind of trying to jam it, all, jam it all to three hours. Now, we have, um, normally there's a break that happens in the middle, but we have a lot of things to cover. So let's see how, we, how far along and how fast we move. We may or may not get the break. Is that okay? Okay. Now, I'm a bit nervous. You guys are a large audience. This could get really go sideways on me. I got all kinds of crazy things to show you as it relates to Kubernetes and OpenShift and technologies like that. Now, a quick show of hands. How many people have put hands on Docker at this point? You know, you've done some Docker run, Docker build, fantastic. That's practically everybody. So that was what was I expected. How many people have been hands on with Kubernetes at this point? All right, a fair number of you, but maybe only 20% of you or so, 25%. So this is kind of an introduction to Kubernetes, but I also have lots of little advanced tips and tricks and things like that to show you as well, depending on how far along we get. So there's a, a lot in this presentation. We're gonna spend a lot of time showing you things from the command line, cube CTL, cube cuddle, cube control, depending on what name you have for that. Um, but at the same time, I wanna show you a bunch of different demonstrations of the different capabilities you can find in this Kubernetes world. Okay, so we're gonna have a lot of fun. Now, the first thing you should note is the slide deck is at bit.ly nine steps awesome. Do you see that at the bottom of the presentation there? Bit.ly nine steps awesome. You have to have that link because there'll be a bunch of other links that you'll want later on. So make sure you grab that link and then also look at the GitHub link as well. I have all the notes for my presentation in that GitHub link and as well as the sample application for this introduction. And therefore, you don't have to take a lot of notes because I already wrote them all down for you. As a matter of fact, I refer to my own notes because I can't remember all these things either. So we're going to actually dig into that GitHub repo at great, in great detail and you're going to want access to that. Okay, but like I said, there's a ton of other links in this presentation you're going to want access to as well. So I do this as a three-hour class, mostly for O'Reilly with Safari Live. Uh, typically, that's a virtual event, meaning I was actually, the last time I ran it was in Turkey last week. I was sitting in Turkey in my hotel room and broadcast it out live. So we also run an Istio one uh, on a regular basis as well. So a three-hour Istio deep dive with the Safari Live team. So keep that in mind. Now, there's going to be a raffle. Okay, we're gonna have a little fun, maybe towards the end, maybe somewhere in the middle, it depends on how sleepy I think you guys are. Because for me, it's really early in the morning. I don't know about you folks, but for me, it really is early in the morning. It's what, 3 a.m. or something of that nature? So I'm totally not switched into the right time zone. So maybe this will help wake you up also. We're gonna give away a couple Chromebooks. I actually have some Chromebooks here. You must be in the room to win for those people watching the live stream or whatever, or the recording. You won't be a part of that. Uh, but just send out a tweet. You know, follow at Burst Sutter, send out a tweet with a picture of the session, and of course, mention at Burst Sutter and DevOx, and then we have a little system that just simply randomly picks from the tweets to see what's out there, and then we'll just give away a couple Chromebooks. Is that cool? Do you guys like Twitter? No? All right, then email me. No, I'm kidding. Just go to Twitter. <laughs> okay, so normally I run this as kind of a hands-on session. We won't be able to do that today because you guys don't have power strips and laptops, and we don't even know if we have enough network connectivity for everyone to be trying this sort of thing. Plus, the setup by itself is the hardest part, and I've already done the setup here on my laptop. So getting a working Kubernetes environment can actually take a long time. So we're in the neighborhood of, let's say, 30 minutes if you have really good hardware and you really know your hardware well, to somewhere around three days. And in the case of this little uh, lab setup that I have here with a mini cube or a mini shift, it can still take an hour or two. And often when I'm putting students through this little class, they might take the whole three hour class to just get set up. So just be aware of that. Setting up can be very challenging. I do have it documented as well on the same GitHub repo. And then I have uh, some links to tips for virtualization drivers. The biggest challenge for most people is do they have enough hardware, number one. And number two, have they ever set up with a virtualization hypervisor at all on their laptop before? Like it might be turned off in your BIOS. It might be you've never used the Mac that way before. You've never used Linux that way before. So that's where it gets challenging. If you have a lot of experience with virtualization, on your laptop, then you'll probably be fine. It, it won't be that hard. Okay, so this is one of the things I use in all my presentations. I've uh, spoken to DevOps now, I don't know, over the last 
12 years or so. And so I've probably used this before. So if you've seen this before, please forgive me because I use it all the time, but it's my favorite thing. I like to think about your journey to awesomeness. Your journey, as that means your learning journey, as you go from one place to the next to the next, because we're always learning, right? We're always growing. Hopefully we're always trying to consume and understand that next new thing. And one of the key things in this new world is organization around DevOps, right? Really focusing on DevOps and how Dev and Ops build better software together. I imagine many of you who work for a large organization probably already have a dev team and an ops team. And in the last year or two or three, your ops team declared themselves the DevOps team. Has anyone seen that happen? Do you have a DevOps team now? Okay. Are there any devs on the DevOps team? Often there's not, right? <laughs> you have some? Fantastic. So that's one challenge already. We basically, like when software developers all declare themselves to be architects, probably 10, 15 years ago, so we can make more money. Ops people declare themselves to be DevOps so they can make more money. Uh, and we have, that's a problem, if you think about it, because Dev and Ops are supposed to be together. All right? We'll keep going here. You have to have some form of self-service on-demand elastic infrastructure. This is where Kubernetes really plays and all the cloud infrastructure really plays, because if you're still waiting for uh, a virtual machine from your centralized IT department, and you're waiting three weeks or two weeks or one week or three days, you're waiting vastly too long. You should be able to spin up a new VM. In this case, we'll spin up pods in the case of Kubernetes. You should be able to do that instantly and wait not at all. And of course, it should be quota driven and API managed. So therefore, you basically will spin up only the resources you can or allowed to. But you should be able to turn on a new experiment instantaneously and try something instantly. That's the beauty of the cloud. That's the purpose of software, uh, software infrastructure that is now software defined. OK, so we're going to do a lot more of that. You got to think in terms of automation. You got to think in terms of I'm no longer feeding CDs and DVDs into trays anymore, like we used to back when MSDN used to ship a big old catalog to us. We'd have to feed CDs or DVDs into CD trays, DVD trays. No, no, and you're no longer going to SSH into a machine and yum install this or app get install that. You now are going to fully automate your environment, meaning you're going to use an Ansible playbook, a puppet, a chef, or even a bash shell script for that matter, and automate the building of your server from scratch and then tear it all back down again. So they call that the Phoenix server, right? The concept of you can burn it to the ground, to ashes, and rebuild it from a script. So that concept is going to be fairly important. And you're going to see that concept as we get more into this Kubernetes thing. You also should think in terms of your CI, CD, and deployment pipeline. We won't have much time on it for this session, just because there, you know, it's another thing, like, uh, another thing that's kind of advanced and set up for you, uh, depending on the environment that you have. But we, we should mention that the fact that you want to fully automate your deployment pipeline as well. It should no longer be on, be on the back of a napkin or in a presentation that your architect or CIO or CTO has in a slide. It should be something fully automated with maybe a Jenkins 2 environment, a Jenkins file. We're going to see some advanced deployment techniques, though, in this presentation. We're going to show you some basics of blue-green deployment and a little bit of kind of canary deployment if we have enough time. Uh, if we have enough time, I'll show you some Istio as well. We can do really smart canary deployment. You can do dark launches and things of that nature. But you can really take advantage of super interesting ways to deploy. And what this fancy new deployment model means is you can test in production. I know that's kind of mind-blowing. You're probably thinking, oh my god, I don't want to test in production. That never happens around here. But there, that's the new idea with blue-green deployment, canary deployment, dark launch. Basically, you are trying to deploy your new software as fast as possible. Because one of the things I always like saying in my presentations that tends to bother some people, I recognize this, but in, for, for all you folks who are software developers, you know, you people who put hands on keyboard and you're knocking down text into that text editor or IDE and you get it to compile, that actually adds no value. Your code offers no value to your organization until it runs in production. OK? So it doesn't matter how many months or weeks or days you spent crafting that awesome algorithm. Until it's running in production and demonstrably adding value to the business or organizational function it's supposed to add value to, then it adds no value. Perhaps you've seen that survey that came out a while back. It was by, by a fellow named Kohave, where they have quantified now that most software that makes it to production only, uh, well, let's put it this way, one third of software that makes a production actually increases the metrics it was intended to increase. Only one third. Another third basically adds no value, and another third adds negative value. Right? So it's a great study that done by Microsoft, a guy who came from Amazon and went to Microsoft. I'd encourage you to check that one out, guy. Check it out by a guy named Kojave. So we tend to produce a lot of software, 
but we have to make sure we demonstrate it running in production. So this concept of deploying quickly, deploying every week, deploying every day, you can start doing that with these new techniques that you'll see here. And then you too can be a microservices unicorn. Does anyone recognize where I stole this image? It's the GitHub unicorn. It's the 503 that they've used before. Uh, so that's actually the GitHub unicorn. Uh, but maybe we want to think about this centerpiece, because that's where we're going to focus. We're going to focus our attention on how we deal with some self-service things, and automation things, not too much on deployment pipeline, but definitely some advanced deployment techniques. This is where Kubernetes really shines. This is where OpenShift takes advantage of those things. This is where Istio, as well, really shines. And then we can be a really awesome unicorn. OK? All right, so the fundamental focus that you have to think about here is we're all about agility now. So this, there's often a question that ha, uh, arises in these Kubernetes sessions that I do. I've talked to a lot of people about Kubernetes. And the number one question is, OK, I've got this application, this big old web sphere application. You know, it's still, yeah, it's still a monolithic application with a big old ear. And, and I'm thinking of you know, putting in a Docker in Kubernetes. And one of the responses I have is, well, is Kubernetes actually going to add value add agility to your situation. How often do you deploy? We deploy, we deploy like clockwork. You know, we're on a mission. We deploy every three months. And how many applications do you have? We have one, one big ear. OK, I don't know if Kubernetes is going to help you a whole lot if you're only deploying every three months and deploying one thing. Kubernetes really shines when you're basically going to deploy every week, every day, every day at noon during the business day. right? And I got 25 or 45 things to deploy. Now you're really living in this new cloud native world. That's really where microservices has taken over. And you'll focus on technologies like Kubernetes to give you greater agility. That's the trump card. So whenever you're asking a question of, oh, that looks hard, that looks painful, I'm not sure why I'm going through that learning curve, fundamentally try to understand, is it giving you greater agility or not? So I want to show you a demonstration real quick. We're going to keep this interesting. And it's more fun for me if I show you stuff live and probably mess things up along the way, because it keeps it exciting for me, too. I want to show you this little thing that we have right here. Okay, What I have is I've deployed, uh, so by the way, OpenShift, this little orange red symbol here, is uh, Red Hat's distribution of Kubernetes. Right? So when I say OpenShift, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, OpenShift, they all mean the same thing. And you'll notice I'm actually running both. I'm running a, a, a little mini cube here. I uh, get pods. OK, nope, I'm not in the in the right namespace, all namespaces. Let's see here. Uh -huh. So I got a bunch of pods running on this Kubernetes cluster. But I also have another Kubernetes cluster here. OK. Uh, kubectl, get pods, all namespaces. So I actually have, at this point, I have this cluster as well as the other one. They're both running on VirtualBox. Let's see if VirtualBox will come up for me. Here we go. So the mini cube one running right here is running with 6 gigs of RAM, two cores, as an example. And I'm running this one that I've named Istio with 10 gigs of RAM and four cores. So I'm running 16 gigs of RAM just for these two VMs right together. And then I'm running about six cores. Uh, I only have a six core machine, so that does tax the machine a little bit. But I have 32 gigs of RAM on this machine, so that makes it very doable. I still have headroom in all these VMs. But I'm not only just running that. I'm also running three publicly hosted cloud environments. Because here's really the point and reason why. Here's the whole, uh, the, whole uh, the whole reason you should be thinking about using Kubernetes, is once you learn it, you can run your application anywhere. OK? Any cloud, private cloud, laptop cloud, a bunch of Raspberry Pis, or in the public cloud across massive vir virtual machines if you want. So I want to show you this little application. I have this little guy running here locally. Let me make this window a little bit bigger. Maybe bump up the font, make it a little easier to see. And so what I have here is this thing called, uh, hopefully you guys have heard of AMQP. Right? So it's an interoperable message broker protocol. So basically, you can move messages from one broker to another to another. But one of the things we've done is we've, we've actually taken that message protocol, and we built a router around it. So in other words, this is not a broker. It's just a router. There's no message storage. There's no store and forward like you have in traditional message brokers. It's purely always forward. As long as it can make the next connection, the next handoff, it just seems, uh, continues to route the message. But as long as you can speak AMQP, you're good to go. So anything in the Java world where AMQP or Node.js or Python, it doesn't really matter. And what this little application does is it routes messages around all these clouds. Okay? So we're going to try that real quick. So I basically have here my Amazon environment running with a single virtual machine and running an OpenShift instance in it. 
okay? I have my Azure environment. I got a connection here, okay. Uh, my Azure environment, that's the Azure console, but the OpenShift running inside it. I have the Google console, okay, GCP, and the OpenShift running inside it. So here's the point, right? I have all these different environments, and quite honestly, on this side of things, they look very different and they behave very differently. So if I'm an infrastructure person, I do have to learn a lot about those individual clouds. You know, how do I set up my keys? How do I get this virtual machine spun up? Is disk being attached correctly? Like in the case of Azure, it attaches a regular hard drive instead of an SSD. You got to know that because it's slow. You know, and there's a lot of infrastructure things, but at the developer level, they all look alike, right? So if I, if I come back out here, you know, they all look alike from the developer's perspective. And, uh, and again, this is a, just a standard Kubernetes kind of environment. Okay, but what we're going to do now is have a little fun with this. Let me put in a message here. I'll just put my name in and hit send. Okay, it says Merhaba because I was last in Turkey. Notice my message went, my, my message, uh, message flow screen also pushed up, pushed up a message. You saw that flash up there. But watch what happens. It actually says it went to the Burr cloud. All right, so the Burr cloud is the one running on this laptop. But there's also Amazon, Azure, and Google there. But let's actually kill the local Burr cloud, okay? So let's say there's no more available capacity in my local cloud, and I'm just basically gonna turn off this uh, message consumer, all right? So that's the consumer and responder to that message. So now I've, re I've re re removed that. Uh, let's do Stefan here, right? I'm gonna hit request, and notice it went to Google, and notice it flashed up Red there too, because red is Google, okay? So right, red was Google. So it went to Google this time. There's no distinction from the user standpoint where that message was processed. It was just processed in a different cloud. That's the beauty of the router, but that's also the beauty of the flexibility, the agility gained by using an architecture like this one. So if I come over here and go to Google, let's go to Google, okay, and that's this guy right here. I'm gonna shut it down. All right, I'm going to turn it off so it can no longer process messages. All right, and let's just put in another name here. It helps if you get your keys, your fingers on our keyboard. And then we go to Alex, and notice it went to AWS and AWS. Okay, right there. So that's kind of the point. You can fail over now, but more importantly, if you run out of capacity in any one cloud, you have all the other available CPU available to you now, and memory available to you. So like, let me bring up my local processor again. Okay, this is the local one. All right, we're just spinning up pods, taking pods down. Remember when I mentioned earlier, you need that elasticity, you need that ability to self-serve. This is kind of that concept. I'm not waiting for anyone to provision anything for me. I'm basically saying, I want one now. I want two now, I want three of these now. So if I come back over here and type in, uh, my sister's name is Dax, so we'll put Dax in here. Okay, notice DAX came back to Burr because Burr is online now receiving messages. But let me pump a little load into this thing. Okay, let's actually drive some load in. So this is load on the local system, the local cloud. And you can kind of see what's happening right now. Okay, by default, we try to keep all the load local. In this case, the local cloud Burr is running about 1, 1,400 transactions per second. You kind of see it, the number changing there. But some are going out to Amazon. Uh, eight transactions per second or so, and then some are going out to Azure based on the overall load. And actually, if I bring my Google one back online, I have it set so that Google is a higher priority than the other two. So we'll see Google actually grab some load and take advantage of those transactions also. And you can kind of see, if you notice over here, this is also showing the state of each of these component processors uh, that are running out there. And this is a little Vertex Java application. But you can see Google now is taking a little bit more load. Okay, and then if I basically come back to my local system, and let's go here, and here, and watch what happens. I have basically took the local one offline again. Again, we may have run out of resource, and now we can burst out to all those public clouds. And if I take down one of those clouds, you'll see it spill over and spill over. And what's really kind of cool, if you have too much load, let's say in Amazon, it'll also spill back over to this laptop which is kind of far out if you think about it. In other words, I can drive too much load in Amazon so it then starts running transactions here, or vice versa. So this little concept of being able to run anything across a, a cloud environment, you can kind of see what's happening here. Basically, Burr is driving load out to the other three, but again, I can reverse the flows if I want to. And you can also put other connections between these different clouds. But this is just uh, based on the Cupid dispatch router. 
Okay, so if you're familiar with the Apache Cupid project, it's called the Dispatch Router, and that's what this technology is, an open source Apache project. But we can, once we have the infrastructure in place, we have Kubernetes everywhere, we can do some really cool things with it. So what do you guys think about that? Is that cool? Okay, so I just want to kind of give you that perspective so you maybe basically have a, a better feel for what it means to live in this new Kubernetes-like world. Okay, so let's get back over here to the presentation and let's get marching along here. Now, looks like not all of you have joined the slide deck. I see 52 people have, but we can, should get more of you in here. There's a few hundred of you in here right now. So make sure you join that slide deck because there'll be other links that you'll want. So the whole concept here is we have to reduce our deployment cycle from so many months or so many weeks down to basically one week or two weeks or three weeks. Basically, if you, if you think about it, the whole concept of Agile and what we do with our Scrum teams and everything else is that we should be able to deploy to production at the end of every sprint. Not the end of a batch of sprints, which is what we normally do, where we have, let's say, three-week sprints, and we do six of those, and 18 weeks later we deploy. No, we should be able to deploy at the end of a three-week sprint, directly into production. That's kind of the goal. Okay? Now, here's our nine steps. You can see it actually starts at zero, and I have a bunch of bonus items. The steps are now probably somewhere getting close to 15 or more, because <laughs> I keep adding things to the presentation and trying to figure out how, what to take away. So we're going to give you a quick introduction to what Kubernetes is. We're going to quickly talk about installation and getting started, only because we're not here to do the install. Uh, you guys won't be able to get a chance to get to the installation. Uh, but I'll just kind of show you some tips and tricks of how to get it running locally. And then we're going to talk about how you build images and run containers in this architecture. We're going to talk about the cube uh, CTL exec command, or OC exec command. We'll kind of show you that one and why that matters. Uh, because you're going to need to know that when it comes to debugging your containerized application. One of the things I'll show you is how the Java virtual machine by default blows up in a C groups architecture, right? So in other words, if you use Docker or if you use Kubernetes, and you, if you ever use Docker in production and you notice that the JVM every now and then restarts, and you probably don't know why, I'll show you why, because uh, it does blow up and, and restart by default, uh, and if you take default settings. And so we'll talk about configuration and logging, we'll talk about service discovery and load balancing, the Live and Readiness Pro, which are super critical to this, uh, what it means to truly be cloud native, truly be Kubernetes native. And then we'll show you some blue-green deployments, rolling updates, things of that nature. Okay? And then I had a lot of feedback from my earlier classes. I had a little section on debugging, and people were like, eh, forget debugging. I don't, it's, it's just setting up the right port and setting up the debugger. It's not a big deal, assuming you can get the port open, which can be a big deal. Um, but the real big one is databases. So I have a whole section on databases now, how to run Postgres as a containerized application within Kubernetes also. Uh, again, all of this is documented. So if you go to the GitHub repo, you're going to see a document for one, two, three, four, five. You're going to see two number nines. And there's even number 10 I start working on um, as a, for that matter. OK? So this is the challenge that we've tried to address over the last several years. As a matter of fact, when we learned the J2E specification, we learned about the different roles associated with well, who builds what and who does what with the artifact. And we put our jar and our war and our war in our ear. You guys remember all that good stuff? I know it's ancient history at this point. Everyone only uses wars at this point. But here's really the key thing to understand. Your application sits on an entire stack of configured other points of infrastructure. It's not just the things in your POM XML that matter to you, and the versions really matter there obviously a lot, but also your custom configuration. Your JDBC driver, which version of the JDBC driver am I supposed to use? How is that configured? What is the name of the data source? Do I have any JMS queues that are predefined? Any users and passwords associated with that? What is the app server or application runtime? Is it a Spring Boot this, WebSphere, WebLogic, JBoss, whatever it might be? Okay, Tomcat. And then you got your JVM. Right? That has to be set up correctly, because you know that it only works on this version of JVM. It doesn't quite work on that version of JVM. Hopefully, you know that at least. And then if you deploy in a Linux environment, what version of Linux are you running? What version of the kernel and what you know, dependencies might you have there? Because that matters, too, in some cases. And then, of course, you have your server hardware. So the good news is we've been trying to solve this problem for quite some time. You know, we actually would bake out golden images of virtual machines. If you live on the Amazon world, you bake out AMIs, and that's what Netflix did. They have AMIs now to solve this problem. Okay, But here's really where it got rough for us here in a traditional data center, traditional on-prem world. We would, as developers and architects, we would basically identify our stack. We would write it all down if we did our jobs well. We'd email the QA department and say, here's how we think you should set up our war file that we just baked out of the development team. And here's, it came out of a Jenkins bill, right? We have a nice war file. Here's where you pick it up from, and here's how you set it up. That's what we used to do. We used to email everybody with those configuration parameters. 
Well, the problem is the email has always gone stale. And we, what version of the email goes with the version of the source code, right? That was always a problem, too. And so we got really clever a few years back. We started using wiki pages instead, right? How many people still use a wiki page to identify the configuration for their application? Only a few of you. Fantastic. Well, actually, a few of you not willing to waste your hands, too. But here's the issue. I'm running on a Windows desktop or a Mac desktop or an Ubuntu desktop or something like that, but my production environment is really Red Hat Enterprise Linux or some form of Solaris or AIX or whatever it might be. It has this version of the JVM. It has this WebSphere version, WebLogic version, whatever it might be, and it's running on a certain version of the, um, of, of, of the JVM, right? So that all matters, the certain version of the operating system, the JVM, all that stack. And so that's really where the challenge comes in, and this is really the beauty of the Docker file. The Docker file codifies your stack. It basically is a programmatic artifact that you can check into your source code repository and helps everyone understand, oh, this is what that application needs. It needs this version of the OS with these de uh, dependencies from the operating system's perspective. It needs this version of the JVM, right, with these configuration parameters for the JVM. It needs this app server layer, whatever the application runtime might be, and that could still be Node.js or Python or Ruby. It doesn't really matter. It's just your application runtime environment. And of course, whatever custom config that you have, like, oh, I need this data source connectivity, I expect this kind of driver for my uh, Oracle database, whatever it might be, you can then build that in your Docker file. And so that was really the beauty of Docker. And that, as we saw earlier with most people raising their hands, we've certainly took advantage of that. Most people now are living in that Docker world, at least from a development standpoint, even if they're not using it in production, just so they can take advantage of the Docker file. Right? This is what we mean. It's no longer a wiki page. It's no longer an email. This is what we need to run our app. Now, it gets a little bit crazier, though, when we run a bunch of these things. As I mentioned earlier, right, you don't really enter the Kubernetes ecosystem when you only have one single application and you only deploy every three months. But we know that we live in this new digitally transforming world where we're the heroes of that story. We're the people who create digital assets. We're the people who know how to put hands to keyboard and create new code, new configuration, new scripts, new infrastructure, whatever it might be. We're the people who literally can take what's in our minds and make it real in the world. Okay? And what we need is those digital creators to work ever faster than ever before. That's what's happening. So the fact that you can deploy every three months was nice, but we need you to deploy every week now. As a matter of fact, the business has regulations that they have to respond to from a government entity standpoint in a particular country, or they might have a certain set of business rules and requirements based on, let's say, the marketing campaign that has to get run, and somebody has to change. Okay, somebody has to change quickly. And then how do we get that change into production? So when we scale this out to across, let's say, six servers, and actually have, yeah, six nodes here, technically I have two running on this laptop and three running in the public cloud, so I only have five, now I think about it, running right now. But how do I scale out across those architectures? How do I avoid port conflicts? How do I manage all those hosts? How do I deal with the fact that something might have died? And so if you live with a pure Docker world, OK, when I say Docker, I mean the Docker command line tool. Uh, and actually, if you notice on my laptop, I'm not running Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows. I turned it off because I'm using Kubernetes as my uh, Docker environment, if you will. All I'm using from Docker is just a Docker command line tool, You know, Docker build, Docker run, Docker PS, Docker images kind of thing. But what this means is I can now go into each of these machines and have that managed for me. I don't have to go into SSH into each machine and go Docker run, Docker run, Docker run, Docker run, Docker run, Docker run. And actually, if something dies, come back around and go, oh, it died, Docker run that again, Docker run this again, Docker run that again, especially if it's Java, OK? Because Java tends to fall over uh, if it's been Docker run uh, because of the nature of something I'll show you in a second, OK? So, how do we keep it up and healthy? How do we keep it alive and well? How do we basically make sure that all those Docker runs are happening magically for me? And that's really where something like Kubernetes comes into play. So this is the symbol icon for Kubernetes. It's pretty awesome stuff. Kubernetes is actually the Greek term for helmsman. I like to think of it as the pilot, if you will, ship's pilot, or the governor. It's basically the orchestrator that's going to basically make all those Docker runs happen for you, OK, across all the servers that you've applied it to. And it ensures that those Docker images and Docker containers, those containers, Linux containers, are up and healthy. And the cool thing is Kubernetes isn't, doesn't require Docker. You could use other container formats as well. But it supports multiple cloud environments. You saw five different clouds, two of which are on this machine running in VirtualBox, and three of which are running on the public cloud. But bare metal environments also. So you can actually run this completely without 
virtual machines and just use bare metal. Literally plug in real physical hardware into your data center's racks and light them up as a Kubernetes node also. It's inspired by Google's uh, focus on containers. You know, they have 10 years of running containers at scale. And so this is where that project originally came from. It's open source written in Go, and it manages applications, not machines. It was meant to be for us as developers to take advantage of, though honestly, it does look, look a little bit like infrastructure often when we're looking at it. OK? So some key capabilities, some self-healing, and we'll see some of that. Horizontal scaling, automatic restarting, and that's a very important aspect of this as well. In other words, it looks for this health and readiness of your application. If it is not healthy, it'll restart it automatically, and that becomes very important uh, later on. And then you're going to also schedule across multiple hosts. It has built-in load balancers. It has rolling upgrades and lots of cool stuff. The first term that you're going to hear in this Kubernetes world is this thing called a pod. And so the most common question I get is, why is the pod called a pod? And some people remember that 70s science fiction horror film, you know, the, uh, you know, the body snatchers, the pod people. Yeah, it's not that. Uh, nor, and you might say it's a pea pod, you know, multiple peas in a pod, right? Nice peas like that. But realistically, it comes from this icon you see here. The concept of the whale and a family of whales is a pod. OK, because you can actually put more than one container in a pod. And that becomes really important when you get into an architecture like Istio, as an example, which has a sidecar container which lives alongside your pod. So the pod is more than one container, Linux container potentially. Typically, you only put one in it. And then you have a shared IP, shared lifecycle, shared storage volume. And all those things get cycled together. OK, so if I have two pods in there, or sorry, two containers in my pod, they all get cycled together. And that's important to know. So therefore, you don't want to put your database and your application in the same pod. I get that question a lot, too. No, the database should be in its own pod and your application in its own pod. Because you can think of this pod as the machine from the application's perspective. In other words, my Java app, my Node.js application, my Python application sees that pod as the machine itself. OK, it's like the, when you restart the pod, it's like the whole computer got restarted. That's how the JVM responds to it. So just keep that in mind. The shared lifecycle of multiple containers in a pod is the key unit of work that we're mostly dealing with. We're trying to get pods out there and running. And then we're you know, tearing pods down, rolling update the pods, things of that nature. And then you have these other two constructs uh, that you might have seen in the Kubernetes ecosystem. The replication controller is the concept of I want to basically make sure that I have two or three or four of these pods running. And you can kind of pick the number you want. So the replication controller is looking at the desired state and ensuring that we have n numbers of those pods running. Okay? And then we have this newer concept. And when I say newer, it's actually pretty old at this point, called the deployment. So in this session, we're going to focus on the deployment, because replication control is a bit older. And the deployment is that truly declared state, meaning what image am I going to use to deploy? How many of those do I want? What are my liveness probes, readiness probes, my constraints for memory and CPU? Your deployment artifact is the one you primarily interact with at this point. Okay, so deployment.yaml, but it is that desired state. Okay, you also have this concept of the service. We'll play around with the service because the service is incredibly powerful. If there's anything that kind of really set this architecture apart from previous architectures that I've seen in this kind of you know highly elastic style way of doing computing, the service being separate from the pod is really a piece of magic. OK? The service holds the real IP, if you will, the DNS entry for the thing. In other words, that's my customer service. That's my human resource service. That's my accounting service. That's my billing service. Think of it like that. It is not ephemeral. How often do you have customers that you decide all of a sudden, no, we no longer do customers at this organization. We're going to only do inventory, and we're going to drop customers? I mean, it does happen, but not too often, right? How often do you move away from inventory to move over to patients? Or maybe you move from patients over to, you know, we're going to just do people. <laughs> you know, you don't, tend to you don't tend to change those major artifacts in your, in your domain-driven design, right, that often. So the service represents that. It represents something that tends to be around a little bit longer, if you will, like customer, patient, client, inventory, HR. But it then sets itself up to invoke or basically pass through the invocation into the actual pod. The pods are very ephemeral. They can come and go all the time. They can get rescheduled from one machine to another machine to another machine. And that's the point. The service is kind of what sticks around. And then you have the concept of labels. And the labels really make the magic happen, because that's how the service knows what pods belong to it. It's based on the label, something as simple as that. 
All right, so your Kubernetes cluster would look something like this set of nodes. I have all these different VMs or actual bare metal servers. I might have like Tomcat and Postgres and uh, Wildfly and Spring Boot and you know who knows what running across those different nodes. And they don't have to be like for like. You notice I use the icons here to represent the fact that some nodes have more load than others. They have different components than others. And then you have this master. Right? The ma Kubernetes master is responsible for ensuring that the workload lands on the right node. Okay? Your application is basically going to make it out there to one of those things. And your dev and ops people are interacting with this API, API server, as some people like to call it. And this is the endpoint, if you will, for your kube cuddle command, kube control command. And then once you give it the declared and desired request, I want this to have two of, I want this image to be running two times, two replicas, with this liveness probe and this readiness probe, it makes it happen. Okay, you make the request, it eventually makes it happen, okay? So the concept of labels, as I mentioned, are very important. Across your different nodes, you might see here that I have this wildfly icon here, and it has an app called cool, so it's just a key value pair. That's all the label is. It's an app called cool. Over here, it's an app called cool as well. You can see it's basically in the environment called dev. This one's also in the environment called dev, but it also this is version one, and this is version two, okay? So literally, I have a different Maven build, a different piece of code running as version two, simultaneously alongside version one. That's a very powerful concept, and it's just something you want to take advantage of because that's how you get your blue-green deployment. That's how you do your canary deployments. You'll see a little bit later. Okay, so these labels really matter, and you can notice we kind of mix prod and dev here, so pre-prod and prod. Obviously, that's not overly common. There are definitely organizations running these clusters at great scale that run one big cluster that is production and non-production. But more often than not, you have a production cluster with a bunch of big honking servers, and then you have a pre-production cluster. Okay? And you just have to move the image and the right artifact over from one to the other. That's all. That's not that big a deal. And that's, if you look at those three uh, public clouds I showed you earlier, that's all I do. Right? I just basically say, you go to that cloud, basically update it with the right set of uh, de deployment artifacts. Now, here you can kind of see we have app called cool, but also this is a different environment and a different version okay, than the one we had earlier. But if we look at it from this perspective, here's our dev environment. Here's our production environment. Here's our version one. OK, makes sense? So the labels really matter. Uh, and you will want to make sure you understand that aspect because that's ex mostly how the magic happens. How does a deployment know what it's managing? Through labels. How does a service know what it's uh, load balancing to? Labels, okay? Right, so here's your key commands. Are we moving too fast, by the way? You can tell me because I tend to move fast because there's always a lot of things to show, <laughs> okay? Kubectl get namespaces. All your components that you create, all the pods that you launch need to go in a namespace. The easiest way to think of it. Typically, you might have in a development environment, one namespace per developer, or you might have a namespace per department, like, oh, that's the HR department. These are all the application components for the HR team, right? Human resource team, or these are all the application components for the customer service team. Maybe that's a namespace. The namespace matters, though, because that's actually how you set up your RBAC, right? Your role-based uh, account control, right? That's where you set up your security. Also, it's where you set up your quotas. So in other words, I'm going to basically have a namespace for that developer or for human resources, and they're only allowed to use so much CPU and only so much memory, as an example. So that, you know, the namespace, we're not going to really delve into that. That's more of an ops issue. But as a developer, just recognize you either are going to create a namespace for yourself, and there's going to have some default quota and privileges associated with it, or most likely the ops team, the DevOps team is going to give you a namespace. And that's what you're going to work with then, with the with, again, with the quota and the certain privileges associated with it. OK, so basically, you can use dash n namespace. That's a fairly common thing to do. Cube cuddle, cube control. You notice this command right here? It has a lot of different names. Uh, we, we were confused from the very get-go. When Kubernetes was born several years ago, we called it cube control, cube cuddle, cube CTL, often I use kubectl, and other people do too. But I think the correct name is kubectl, though some people refer to it as QB cuddle. That's kind of cute also, isn't it? OK, but just keep that in mind. When you hear that phrase, uh, you, you might be confused. And you're going to see that little CTL thing show up again and again. For instance, the Istio command line tool is Istio CTL. OK, I'm wearing a t-shirt from the podcast called Pod CTL, pod control, right? So you might hear control, CTL. Cuddle, you know, in that phrase. Then you can see our my run command, the logs, expose, and scale, all kinds of good stuff there. So let's actually hop over here real quick, sh show you some things. That's my mini shift environment. Let me go to my mini cube environment. 
Okay, so I can say QB cuddle, cube cuddle, cube control, get namespaces. And you can see I have several namespaces here. I have default, demo, cube public, cube system, and test. Uh, the ones I created were demo and test. We're going to create another one in a second. Uh, but at the same time, I can come over here to look at my mini shift environment. Whoop, and not that, mini shift environment. And QB cuddle, get namespaces. You can see I have a lot more namespaces here. I have a bunch of different ones here because in a mini shift environment, an open shift environment, it actually sets up a few more things for, for me, like a cool console and other things of that nature. But I have one called tutorial there. And I can say cube cuddle, get cube cuddle, get pods, dash in, tutorial. Okay, and you can see I have three application components running there. This is actually a Spring Boot app, Spring Boot application, and a Vertex application. You can think of that as like three application servers running. And here's one cool thing right out of the gate. That's three JVMs all running on port 8080 on this laptop right now. So if you've ever tried doing that before, it's actually very hard or at least painful, and you actually give up on it, right? You basically put one on 8080 and one on 8080. 81 and one on 8082, and then if you have this Tomcat running over here, it messes you up when you try to run JBoss, which messes you up when you try to run Spring Boot, which messes you up when you run Vertex. And so in this case, I can run everything on 8080 because it's hand being handled within the Kubernetes environment for me. Okay? So what else do we have here? Oh, a couple key tips that you'll see in the documentation that I give you. Again, on the GitHub repo, I try to document all of these things, right? So we basically talk about how to set up Minikube to be your Docker environment. So if we look here, dun, 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 this is actually a good tip to have, okay? If I come over here, Minikube, Docker ENV, look what it does here. It basically exports these four environment variables, one of which is the host name and the port. Now, this is very important. If you've done Docker before, which most of you have, this is one that's going to bite you, so just mentally plug this in. Because I'm using Minikube and Minishift, I can expose port 2376 on that virtual machine and treat it like a regular Docker daemon. Keep in mind, a Docker daemon doesn't have a login requirement. Okay? You would not have this in a production setting or in a public cloud setting. You do not expose a Docker daemon on the public cloud, because if you do, then people can come play with your Docker daemon, right? They can come over here and go, oh, what is, what is that person running? Oh, they're running a lot of cool stuff. Maybe I want to you know, kill those processes, stop those processes. Maybe I want to build my own image and run my own image in your Docker environment. So don't expose the Docker daemon unless you know what you're doing. Um, so what that means is, in order to move artifacts, especially images, from one cluster to another, whether Docker daemons are not visible, you have to have another tool for that. And there's lots of tools, right? You can just find one. Worst case scenario is you can export the Docker image to a tar file, put it on a flash drive, and sneaker net it over if you had to. OK, because you can actually do that. It's just a tar uh, and move it if you had to. But there's one called Scopio that's fairly popular, uh, one that the Red Hat team worked on. OK, uh, but I can say Docker images here. And I can interact. So I'm actually messing around now with the Docker daemon running in my Minikube. Same thing if I go back to Minishift here. If I go do Docker images, same thing applies. OK, I can actually see I got a bunch of Istio stuff running in my, uh, in a bunch of Istio running in my Minishift environment. That's why I gave it more memory. But you can see I got a bunch of stuff running there, lots of Docker images. And there's the messaging application I was showing you earlier, too, right? The, that's the front end is this guy over here. And then the worker was the message processor. OK, so there's a bunch of stuff running there already. And you can see, again, another Vertex application, another Vertex application, all running there. OK, so kubectl get pods uh, in to dust demo to AMQ, right? So there's the pods associated with that. OK, so let's keep marching along here. I just want to show you that briefly to kind of make sure you're still woken up and paying attention. But that's what you're going to do. Use these command line tools and interact with your cluster. That's the good news is you don't have to learn a ton of things. You just have to learn this one tool, if you will. OK, and then you can interact with your cluster. Now, microservices are fundamentally about distributed computing. As I mentioned earlier, if you have one big ear and you're just deploying that every three months, this is overkill. OK, this is just you're take, bringing a shotgun to kill a to kill a fly is kind of the way to think of it. Right. And not, that's the, not the exact phrase, is it? But the concept is you want to be in a microservices like architecture. So you might use something like a drop wizard, which is the people that came out, came out very early with the concept of fat jar. So drop wizard and vertex came out really early on many years ago with the concept of Java dash jar and running a fat jar. Spring Boot, of course, is very popular. Wildfire Swarm is now called Thorntail. Right. That's a micro profile implementation. There's this whole micro profile effort. There's actually a micro profile session happening concurrent with this one right now, 
what I are, so you might be you know, missing that. But the concept is we've been thinking about how to break up big applications into smaller applications for quite some time. And this little chart kind of gives us a little history lesson, if you don't mind. We've been thinking about how to break up a monolithic waterfall, big old team into smaller units for quite some time. So we, think, we thought about extreme programming, XP, back in 99, we have this concept of continuous integration. How do we move a little faster? Instead of integration every now and then, let's integrate all the time, okay? Ideally, we integrate every day because we check our code in every day and the automated build runs and runs our tests. The Agile Manifesto came out in 2001. Again, how do we take big teams and make them smaller teams? The cloud was born in 2006. As an example, so oh, this, cha this changed the rules on us. It's like, wait a second. I don't have to wait for the, my IT department for three weeks to get a virtual machine. I can spin up a virtual machine with my credit card. That was a game changer for us as software developers. We could then take the idea in our head and immediately start trying it out with a machine. Because think about that for one second. If you're a software professional, and we used to tell you, I'm sorry, please file a ticket. Two vice presidents will sign off on it, and you'll get a virtual machine later on. We're telling you, you can't have a computer for so many weeks or so many days. You kind of need computers to do your job, right? That's kind of like if we told a home builder they couldn't have hammers or nails or saws or things like that for so many days. So this concept of the cloud was very powerful. Just to put that in perspective, Java E6 was born in 2009. The phrase DevOps was born in 2009. What really got interesting, though, was Netflix and Drop Wizard and Vertex. Okay, so Netflix moves to the cloud and starts thinking about cloud native architecture. Drop Wizard and Vertex were born in 2011. They showed us this concept of not building big old wars and ears, but little tiny fat jars and running a little tiny application. Okay, Netflix, of course, then open sources what they were doing with Hystrix, Eureka, and Ribbon in 2012. And then microservices start showing up on the ThoughtWorks radar in 2012. So here's a, we've been thinking about this for many years, over six years in some cases. And then Docker was born in 2013. It was actually born based on a five minute demo and, a, and a, so a lightning talk at a Python conference. And from that five minute lightning talk, the world was lit on fire. They showed us Docker build, they showed us Docker run, and we lost our minds. We're like, oh my God, that changes everything. We knew about Linux containers for many years. They've been out there for quite some time, but no one had ever made it easy to use, okay, until we saw Docker build, Docker run. Spring Boot born in 2013, okay? Microservices officially defined by the ThoughtWorks team in 2014. That really made it popular once we had a formal definition for what that was. And Kubernetes born in 2014. So Kubernetes has actually been out there for quite some time too. As a matter of fact, in 2015, based on this announcement in 2014, we, I work, there's a presentation I have on YouTube where you actually see us launch a thousand containers live on stage in two and a half minutes a thousand app servers, by the way, a thousand application containers. And then we invite the audience to claim one. We had over a thousand people in the room and they all claimed their own container by uploading their own little flag, a little image that they painted on their phone. And they actually, we dropped that image on every one of those individual machines. When I say machine, I mean pod, okay? Because from the developer standpoint, it's just like a computer. So a thousand and two and a half minutes is an example. So this is an incredibly powerful technology, but what else happened in 2012? Netflix reinvented TV as well. Can you imagine that? Seriously, we went from cable, you know, people who watch cable all the time to people who were cable cutters. So they actually did a lot of innovative things in that same time window. So maybe as of 2015, you were thinking of using Spring with Eureka, Spring with Hystrix, Spring with Ribbon, Spring with Config Server. As of 2016, because of Kubernetes and technologies like it, we could eliminate Eureka. We get service discovery for free with a Kubernetes architecture. We get load balancing for free with a Kubernetes architecture. We get configuration as part of the Kubernetes architecture. We see all those things in this presentation. And then, when, of course, we still had Zipkin and Zool and Hystrix still out there as of 2016. But as of 2017, we moved from Zipkin to Open Tracing, okay, Open Tracing being a standardized API around the tracing concept, and then Jaeger from the Uber team became more popular, and so Jaeger is the current winner, if you will, in this space. Zool was still out there, and Hystrix is still out there, okay, but as of 2018, we've further streamlined this further with Istio, so Istio allows me to eliminate, let's say, Hystrix in some cases, not all cases, uh, but you know, you actually get circuit breaking at the network level now with Istio. Plus, you get additional tracing and additional monitoring and metrics. And to kind of make that point, we're, this is not a session on Istio. Istio is rather advanced. But I'll just show you this right here real quick, just so you get a feel for it. Uh, this one right here. Let's see here. Let me just run my polar script. So if you remember, I had the uh, cube. Let me type correctly. QB cuddle get pods dash n tutorial. I had these three pods. Ta -ta -da. Oh, it helps if you put the L at cube 
cuddle, cube control, there we go. So customer preference and recommendation, you can see it's basically making that three little microservices, three different JVMs, all being connected there together. And then I can kind of see I have my monitoring here with the workload uh, dashboard in Istio. So I can look at the customer, I can look at preference, I can look at re recommendation here, you can see it's charting along, okay? I also have the tracing built right in too. Let's look at the most recent traces. And you can kind of see here, here's the spans associated with those traces. You can see how long each of these invocations take, you know, five milliseconds, you know, three milliseconds kind of thing. And you can kind of see it marching along there. Let's see, there we go. Okay, so that's one thing you get with Istio right out of the box. You get some instantaneous tracing, you get some monitoring and metric gathering, and then of course you can do some really fancy stuff with playing with the route rules, which I might be, if we have time, I'll show you that too. Okay, so that was, that's really the point of this slide, is to say that Istio further augments your architecture, and then you might start looking at Istio to augment your Kubernetes architecture. Okay, so let's keep going here. One thing that's also important to note is all this awesome Netflix stuff and Spring stuff was awesome for people on the JVM. And most people here are probably on the JVM. But is there anyone who actually has workloads that are not on the JVM right now, like Node.js, Python? A lot of you, okay, so a lot of Python, Node.js. C Sharp, maybe some C Sharp workloads, things of that nature. So the good news is this applies to any of those workloads now. You get load balancing, you get configuration, you get service discovery, you get circuit breaking, even if you're Node.js, even if you're Python, even if you're C Sharp, even if you're Go. It doesn't matter what it is because it's now applied at the infrastructure level. You don't have to have annotations in your code anymore for service discovery. You don't have to have annotations in a jar file for client-side load balancing. You don't have to carry the jar file for circuit breaking anymore in your POM XML because it's now at the infrastructure level, okay? So all these concepts here really matter. The concepts of, do you define an API and how do you manage that API through your application logic? And maybe you have a Swagger document, et cetera, and it doesn't really matter what you build that in. But these other aspects of microservices architecture are things like, how do I discover another component in the architecture? How do I discover another service? How do I invoke it? Is it elastic? In other words, if I call it, is it gonna fail over? If the one that I'm talking to is not performing very well, can I scale out, can I scale back? You know, resiliency, what happens if it's too slow? You know, things of that nature. Is there a pipeline driving my application workload to production, or through at least the stages of dev, you know, dev stage production kind of thing. What is my authentication authorization mechanisms, my logging and monitoring and my tracing? All these things should be considered as you enter into this world where we're no longer dealing with one ear and deployment every three months. We're dealing with 25 things and we want to deploy every week, right? When you live at that scale, deploy rapidly, you got to start thinking about all these items, okay? So installation is can be the hardest part of learning Kubernetes. You gotta get your hands on a Kubernetes cluster and make it work, okay? And Minikube is really awesome. I use it a lot, and Minishift I use every day, right? So, that, so Minikube is nothing more than a little tiny Kubernetes cluster running in a virtual machine. I'm running it here on VirtualBox. I showed you this earlier. I'm just running it on VirtualBox, uh, but I could use Hyper-V if I'm running on Windows. I could use K KVM if I'm running on Linux. You know, you just have to pick the right virtualization solution and launch your VM. But I'm also running Minishift here, okay? And this is also running Istio and a bunch of other things. So I have that running here as well. So you can basically run either of those pretty easily assuming you have virtualization support. You can also use GKE up at Google very easily. Amazon, of course, has EKS now, Elastic Kubernetes Service. Am Azure has AKS, Azure Kubernetes Service. There's OpenShift.com. There's another thing called OC Cluster Up that requires a Docker daemon. This is also very popular. There's tons of options to run a Kubernetes cluster, okay? At this point, you can find one somewhere and run one. Now, again, this pro is probably the harder part to think about. The, the, the way I would demo this normally, and we're not gonna do this here, but you can kind of see I have a whole document that walks you through how to set these things up. Uh, so what to download, what you know, your prerequisites are, like you can see I do have Docker installed because I can do things like Docker images here, and I am talking to that, you know, my local Docker daemon, right? So that, that, is, that is Minishift Docker ENV, or Minikube Docker ENV, right, depending on which one you're on. So just remember that trick right there. That's an important one. But again, you won't find us in a production cluster. All right. Uh, what else we have here? Oh, in the case of Kubernetes, Minikube, there's one thing, uh, OC project. I'm on the Minishift environment. So right, look right here. I'm basically, if I say OC project, it tells me I'm on the tutorial project, uh, namespaces. You also notice I'm using OC and kubectl interchangeably. 
because you can. OC is just the OpenShift command line tool, which is just you know a superset of kube cuddle, kube control. But if I come over here and look at something else, uh, let's see, OC project, Istio system. I can switch namespaces, and now if I say kubectl get pods, right? I'm looking at the pods there. So the concept of being able to switch namespaces is something built into the OC command line tool. We refer to it as project. In the case of Minikube, it's a little bit more cumbersome. So there's another tool called kubectx, I highly recommend, and kubeNS that you can download, and that's recommended in the document. And you can say kubeNS, and I want to switch to the uh, demo namespace, and now I can say kubectl get pods. All right, if I say kubeNS, NS test, and I say kubectl get pods, you can kind of see I'm dealing with the uh, three different pods here. This is a Go app, Node app, Python app, and this other was a Spring Boot app running against Postgres, as an example. OK, so you can jump back and forth between your namespaces with cube in S for a mini cube. Just remember that. That's an important tip because that one is painful, uh, unless you know it, that trick. OK, download everything, set up your environment, set up your mini cube home, mini shift home. The good news is if there's a distinction in how mini shift or mini cube work, I do call that out. OK, but otherwise they work the same. All right, the cube cuddle and OC work basically the same. So you kind of see how I basically talk about how to set up your memory, how to set up your CPUs. Again, you can use VirtualBox. A lot of people are now starting to like HyperKit on Mac. I still use VirtualBox because it's available everywhere. I can basically take this script, if you will, and run it on Windows, run it on Linux, run it on Mac, okay, with VirtualBox. Uh, and it's kind of what I'm used to, and there's VirtualBox. Once you have it running, okay, you can also look back at your config. You can see right there, there's the Minikube config view. Let me go here, back to this one, and mini shift config view. Okay, there's also mini shift dashboard. And so we, we've already seen this already. So there's the main dashboard for mini shift. In the case of Minikube, okay, they also have a dashboard. We have one there. It helps if you spell it correctly, though. Uh, and then you can kind of see what that looks like. OK, so you can kind of look at your different namespaces. So we saw earlier I had test, and we had our three pods there, the Node.js, the Python, the Go. OK, uh, so you can see what image it's tied to, things of that nature. So you do have graphical consoles to interact with the, the Kubernetes cluster you're dealing with. Also, if you're dealing with a Kubernetes cluster hosted by a third party, like a cloud provider, they're going to have their own console their own way to look into their console. So kind of just know that there's always going to be kind of a unique console per Kubernetes cluster that you encounter. The only thing that's kind of the same same is really the command line tool. OK. What else do we have here? Make sure we cover our key ground. Well, I'll show you the consoles, get namespaces, showed you that already. We talked about Docker ENV. Uh, with that, you can do Docker images, showed you that. Oh, this is actually an important one. So how do you know if your mini cube or mini mini shift are happy, you can SSH into the virtual machine. So now I'm inside that VM, and I can go look at my free memory. I can look at my disk space. These things can be important. So df-h, free-h, because if you're running out of resources within that little cluster, because you can, you might have run way too many pods, right? Let's say you run 15 JVMs. That's probably going to eat up all your memory relatively fast. Uh, and actually, how do you know you're running out of resources? It's because when you come over here and do kubectl get pods, and you're looking at your pods, man, I forget the L, look at that. Um, you see how it says running here? You'll see pending instead. Okay, pending is like, I'm trying to schedule it, but I can't find a server with enough resource available. Uh, this thing is going to need too much memory. And you might see pending. That happens a lot for a developer on their laptop. I've seen that with a lot of students in my classes. So just keep that in mind. So you might go check out, you know, do I have enough memory? Do I have enough disk space? What's eating my CPU, right, inside the VM? All right, so there, you know, looks like, well, we made that too small. <laughs> but if I had a bigger window, you could see what top shows. Can we see it here? Not that one. Not top on the Mac, but top in the VM. Yeah, it's not going to display properly for me. I made it too small. OK, but you can look and see what's using your CPU, things of that nature. So knowing how to get into the VM is important. So that's mini shift or mini cube SH, SSH. All right. And in the case of OpenShift, you do have to log into it. So OpenShift is secure by default. Mini shift is secure by default. That's a little bit different than a regular Kubernetes. So that's why we call it out there. But you can just come over here now and just run something. So if I come over here and say kubectl get namespaces, I want to be in the kubeNS default one, right? kubectl get all, 
what's running here. It does have a single service, and this is one that comes out of the box, so don't mess with it, okay? But I'll leave that there, and what I want to do is run this kubectl run command. So with this, basically, the run command, which is not normal for you to use, but it's a little bit like your Docker run, okay? A little bit like your Docker run. So normally you do Docker build, Docker run, but in this case, you're basically running a built image. This is coming from the Google registry, all right? You will see things like Docker IO for the Docker registry, GCR IO, things like that. And then you basically say what port you want it to run on. But look at everything it created when I just did that run command. It basically created a deployment because we're going to learn more about deployments. It created a pod, and it created a replica set. Okay, so just that one command created these three different artifacts, which I could have managed individually. Typically, you just deal with a deployment, and it takes care of the rest. Okay, uh, and now we have that thing running, and so it's pretty straightforward to run something. But you got to also, and actually, let's do this: cube cuddle uh, exec it. Let's actually go into the pod, so into that container. All right, bin bash. Now I'm inside it, and I think it's running on uh, 8080 is what we said, right? There we go. So it's a little Nginx application right there, Nginx application running on 8080. And when I basically go inside and say curl localhost, because I can, because I'm inside that pod now. So I'm inside the machine, therefore localhost matters. I can do other things like PS, right? What else is running in here? Oh, it doesn't have PS running. So it depends on what you know, what tools you have available to you inside that Linux machine, right, inside that Linux pod. Uh, let's get back out of it, though. And what I want to do is expose the deployment via a node port, via service. Now we say get cube cuddle get services. All right, now I have this hello minikube service. And notice this concept of node port. So by default, when you're dealing with a Minikube architecture, there's no built-in externalized router, right? That's how we think of it. Uh, so basically, you deal with this concept of a node port. This port is open on the VM, open on that, open on that node. So if I say Minikube IP, like that, right? That's the IP address of the thing. So I can say 192.168, and then 99.102, and then 32.657. There we go. So that's the same application that's running. I just curled it from an external uh, standpoint. So if I come over here and bring it up in my browser, right, just to show, show that it's, it is running here. There we go. All right. So that is what that application is doing. And it even gives us the host name. Notice the host name there. It actually is the same host name as kubectl get pods. Right. See the host name right here too. In other words, it's the pod identifier, all right? So you can basically say, what is the ID of that virtual machine, uh, or sorry, pod in this case, and then what is the name of the uh, name of from hostname standpoint? You'll see that in a Java way also. Okay, we have our services. You also, there's another way to get the URL for it with Minikube here. You can get it, just run this command, tell you what that URL is for it. But just know the real secret sauce is this concept of the node port, okay? And we're gonna drill down on this a little bit more in a second. But basically, this lets you know that your environment is working pretty well. All right, so I have set up, I've installed. You can delete the service, so I can just wipe out that service now if I want to get rid of this and actually free up resources. So I'm going to delete it. I'm going to delete it. And watch what happens if, when I delete this. Uh, watch, kubectl get pods. OK, I'm going to delete the deployment. So kube control, delete deployment, hello minikube. And it actually will tear down the pod. OK, because the deployment is the unit that says, what state would you like in this world? I want one replica of that pod running, right? Uh, therefore, it has the replica set associated with it. And once I de delete the deployment, it basically marks that pod for termination and will eventually get around to cleaning that up. And, and therefore, you get that resource back, right? The memory and CPU associated with it. Uh, so you can kind of just watch that happen. And then uh, if you have to, you can minikube stop, minikube start. So if you actually want to turn that virtual machine off, stop and start, works fine. You can also wipe it out entirely and recreate it. OK, I'm not going to do that now because I don't have time to wait on it. But keep that in mind. There are two directories you should be aware of, one called config.json here in the Minikube home, and another one called .cube.config. These things can get a little bit trashed at some times, okay? Meaning you've done, you connected to this cluster and this cluster and this cluster and this cluster and 10 different clusters, and you're like, wow, I've got way too many things listed in my config.json. And, and, and so over time, you might want to decide to clean those things up a little bit. Uh, let me see if I have a more messy one I can show you real fast here. Let's see, uh, cube CTX over here. 
Like here's a good example. Over here in my OpenShift environment, you can see all the different places I've been connecting to. And actually, see, it basically has a reference to the uh, Amazon one, you know, the Google one, the Azure one, things like that. So that's what this, in those files, basically your configuration and your context. And you might every now and then decide just to wipe those out and start from a clean slate. So that's a good tip as well, because uh, in the early days of Kubernetes, they would get a little bit bungled up, and we would tell people, Could just go wipe those files and try again, and then magic happens, OK? So that is really all there is to kind of getting set up, though st setup can be very hard. All right, we got to move along a little faster here. <laughs> we got a lot more ground to cover. OK, you guys still with me? Is this worth your price of admission? It will be. We'll get there. OK. So getting your Kubernetes architecture, Kubernetes cluster set up is, can be fairly hard, especially if you want to set it up across multiple servers. Because by default, you're going to set up, if you're for a real production environment, somewhere around 6 to 12 servers. Because you need to have three for your, uh, uh, your quorum on your etcd server. Your master node needs to probably have three of those. That's pretty typical. And then you're going to have so many worker nodes, right? Like I'm going to have to run my apps across so many workers. In the case of Minikube and Minishift, and what you see me have running here, I'm running everything in one big VM. OK, so the master as well as the workers are all really one thing. You can do it that way too, but that would definitely not be recommended for production. Typically, you have three masters, and then you have so many worker nodes based on your workload. So you're into the six range pretty fast you know, and beyond. And so you just have to make sure you set those up correctly. OK, but building an image for a developer is going to be a fairly common task. And so here's the pattern I want you guys to get in your head right away. OK, I'm going to build my application like my Node.js application with NPM. I'm going to build my Python application with pip. I'm going to build my Ruby application with gem. I'm going to build my Java application with Maven, let's say, and I'm going to get a nice executable fat jar or war or whatever you might have as your artifact. And then you have to do the next thing. So I have my application. I have my war file. I have my Java application. I got to find a base image to run this on. And there are a number of places to find base images. Docker Hub is the most popular one and most well known. And you can go to Docker Hub and just search for a base image do you think meets your needs. Just, but, but just be aware that you, know, you don't really know the providence of that Docker image. You don't know who worked on it. You don't know what things they put inside it. You don't know if they fixed the CVEs in it. So just got to keep that in mind. Uh, certainly, the Docker community tries to keep those things updated. But to some degree, it might just be what Joe or Fred or Sam or Mary created on their own. And they could have stuck whatever they wanted to in there, OK? Something that runs, and then you won't even know. OK, and this is a Linux machine, so you can do really cool stuff with it. So just keep that in mind. There's also Quay.io, GCR.io, which is a Google one. And then Red Hat also provides a certified set of container images. So you can start with, like, if you want to run a Java one, or if you want to run with Postgres, or you want to run with Node, et cetera. So figure out where your base image is going to come from. I highly recommend, for anybody going to production with this kind of architecture, thinking about how to roll your own base image. That way you know exactly what you're getting in your base image. You know exactly what the base Linux operating system is, what kernel version, what dependencies you need installed there. You can wipe out stuff from the distribution you don't need. We don't need an FTP server. We don't need Firefox, right? You can make sure those things are gone, if that's what was in your base image to begin with. Uh, and then you put the right version of the JVM with the right dependencies underneath it, with the right Node.js runtime, Python runtime, et cetera. So think about building your own base image. For Getting started purposes, I'm just showing you base images I mostly pull from Docker Hub. Okay? You then have to craft your Docker file, where the from command is the key element there to figure out where you're going to get that base image from. Then you're going to build your image, and then you're going to have two other artifacts. Okay? You're going to have a deployment YAML and a service YAML, which is how you would launch that thing into a Kubernetes architecture. So two additional files. Now, there's a lot of effort in this space to remove the need for those two files. You're going to see lots of tools out there in the ecosystem that have removed this, removed that. And, but in many cases, they've introduced yet another YAML file. So in this class, I just try to show you the basics for what you would have across any Kubernetes uh, cluster you encounter. Okay, it doesn't matter where that Kubernetes cluster comes from or who, what vendor gave it to you. The deployment YAML and service YAML should work for you. Okay, and then of course you have to expose your URL that you've created out to the world at large. Now this is actually an important step to understand because every Kubernetes cluster has a different form of load balancer slash ingress, some externalized routing architecture, and they're all unique. OK, so depending on what Kubernetes cluster you're talking to, this concept of exposing a URL is going to be unique per cluster. Like in the case of OpenShift, we actually ship out of the box one called HAProxy. You've probably heard of HAProxy before. That's the externalized load balancer. So all you do is say, hey, I want an externalized URL outside the cluster. 
and you get one and you have one to use right away. But in the case of Minikube, it doesn't have that out of the box, right? You don't have an externalized URL. That's why I use that node port trick to access the actual service that I've declared. And then in the case of GKE or Amazon, you know, you're going to get a different solution for each one of those. So just keep that in mind. Number six is unique per cluster, okay? Uh, you would do a Docker build, and then you could do kubectl run like you saw me do earlier. But there's a lot of different tools, like the Fabricate Maven plugin. One thing cool about the Fabricate Maven plugin is you don't have to have a Docker file or deployment or service YAML. It will try to figure those things out for you. Okay? Now, you may or may not want that. Uh, you might want more control. But it is a nice, quick and dirty way to just try something, just throw it a Kubernetes cluster just to see if your jar file will work. So if you give it a fat jar or a war, it just tries and sends it out there. So it's a Maven plugin, and it'll try to deploy it. Um, but it will fail at times because it's picking in the base image that may not be appropriate for your, uh, your, your application. There's also Jib, which came from the Google team not too long ago. And it also is another Maven plugin that, that generates a Docker image for you. So you don't have to do a Docker build with uh, Jib. You just basically do a, a Jib build, and it does the Docker build for you. There's also the concept of Hel Helm charts that's very, very popular. Again, you got a different set of YAML than a deployment YAML and a service YAML. But with a Helm chart, if you have three or four different application components that get deployed together, right, three different deployments in the case of Kubernetes, maybe you want to orchestrate deployment one, then two, then three, and Helm helps you with that. The problem with Helm is it relies on the service called Tiller, and Tiller has to operate as a privileged service within your cluster meaning it has more privileges than it probably should. And so that's one reason we never recommend it in production, uh, because you now have something with elevated privileges, which means if someone gets into it, they have elevated privileges. Uh, and you wouldn't necessarily want that. With Helm Charts 3, though, Tiller will be an optional element, and you can basically use Helm Charts from the command line perspective. There's also another tool called Compose. It takes your Docker Compose YAML. Again, the original Docker Compose concept would allow you to basically say, oh, this application with this database, with this network setting, you could compose those multiple Docker images into, a, you know, say, a full stack. Well, you can also just consume that file and make Kubernetes YAML out of it. Okay? Kedge is kind of going away. That was a project, actually, a team that I work with had started, but we kind of have given up on it at this point. It was a way to shorten some of the YAML down by a few notches, because you'll see that the YAML in Kubernetes can be a little verbose, though it has a purpose, and there was a way to kind of shorten that down. And then there's a lot of other things. So the one that uh, you'll also see coming out right now is Builda, Podman, and Kaneko. This from the Google team, these two from the Red Hat team. Different ways to build images without Docker. Right? That's a very common request. It's like, how do I eliminate DOCKER from my repertoire and tool set? We've been working on that too. So you wouldn't have to use any Docker at all. You would just use something like Podman. And another thing about it is it doesn't require Docker daemon, which is pretty even more awesome, Which because Docker daemons by themselves require their own care and feeding. Like I mentioned earlier, when I went and SSH into the VM, I showed you to look at the disk space, because if you do a ton of builds, you'll sometimes see the Docker daemon eats all your disk space inside your VM. Uh, and then you got to go fix that manually sometimes. Okay? So lots of stuff going on. Build Packs is a new one, by the way, just proposed by the Heroku team and the Cloud Foundry team. All right, so your Docker file for a Java project, uh, we use this one called Fabricate a lot, but you can pick and choose all sorts of different ones. In the case of the base image that you pick, though, you then have to know how to set my application into that base image. And the Fabricate one has this concept of slash deployments. You drop your fat jar into the deployments directory, and that's all you got to do. OK? But I'll show you a different one, only because it is somewhat more interesting to show you a different one. Let me go flip over here to my Minikube environment. And actually, let's turn this polar off so we're not wasting CPU cycles on that. And we'll come back to that in a second. All right, let's go here and here. And where am I at? Let's go hello. And let's just go into my Spring Boot application. All right, I'm going to bring up Visual Studio Code here. This is my new favorite tool, Visual Studio Code, uh, just so you're aware of it. It's a free tool that you can download. It's not Visual Studio. It's Visual Studio Code. It's a lightweight editor. But the Java language support is, comes from Red Hat. Uh, so that's why it, I work with the team that does this. So we've had 9 million downloads of this tool, uh, the Java support for v VS Code. But let's go to here. OK. So here's a little Java application. Right here, a little Spring Boot application, pretty straightforward stuff. If we look at the POM XML. Nothing unusual here, because it doesn't really matter what the application is, OK, at this point, because anything runs in a Kubernetes architecture, at least if it runs on uh, a Linux container. 
But you can kind of see it has Spring Boot Starter Web. It has Dev Tools, which is nice because you can make code changes now and see what the result of that is. And then, of course, it has a nice little REST controller endpoint here. And the one that we'll focus on right now is this one that's at the root level. And it basically is going to return, it uh, looks like Aloha. So let's see if we can make that wor work. Maven Spring Boot uh, Run. OK, let Spring Boot run. Come on, come on, come on. Takes a few seconds to start up. And I'm just running this on localhost, in this case, the Mac localhost. And it does say Aloha Spring Boot. And notice it has this number. That is just a little counter and increment that helps me know that the JVM is still alive and well and hasn't been recycled. The Aloha string right here, and unknown, meaning it doesn't know what host name it's coming from. So right here, it says system get env host name, and it puts down unknown, because it just doesn't know that right now. And if I want to change Aloha to something else, uh, let's go bonjour. OK. And actually, I was just in Turkey, so let's go back to Merhaba. How about that? Save that. And you can see with DevTools, it automatically reloads for me back there. And there's Merhaba. So let's say that's the Java application I want. OK. I, I've tested it now. That's what I believe my business wants. So I can say Maven. Uh, yeah, clean package, and I can get the fat jar out of that. So Maven clean package will give me the fat jar, standard kind of thing there. All right. So it's in the target directory. There it is. So I can say, I can double check that real quick. So uh, boot demo, run it, let it run. And there we go. All right. So there it is, Merhaba, still fantastic. And now I can build. Remember, I said we can do our Docker images, right? We can do a Docker build, dash T. Nine steps, awesome. Helps if you spell things correctly. And then my boot. And let's just call this version one. Do we want version one? I don't think I have another. Let me double check real quick. Docker images, grep. Nine steps. I have some others out there, but not this one. So uh, yeah, let's do this. So I have version one now. And put the dot there. There's my Docker build. Happened real fast because I've already cached these layers on this application. So again, this is working off the Docker daemon I have inside my Minikube environment. OK? So if I, well, let's just actually just run this one again. All right, so there is the MyBoot v1 with the tag 14 seconds ago. So that's the one I just created. And so I now have that one. But let's actually look at the Docker file. This is the one I picked up by default. I'm just going to use OpenJDK version 8 coming from Docker Hub. And again, I pre-pulled it. And if I use that base image, I define this environment kind of thing. I copy from target over here. And then I say java-jar, just like I did the command line earlier, java-jar. And I'm running that Java microservice now, Okay, that Spring Boot app. So it's very straightforward. And I'm exposing 8080. Okay, I'm not exposing a, a, you know, anything for JMX or anything like that, just 8080, just to keep it very simple. I have that thing built now. So you could do kubectl run and run it if you wanted to. But the right thing to do is actually have a deployment YAML. So I have some deployment YAMLs here. You can see I have several of them. I have the my boot deployment. That's this guy right here. OK, so let's look at it real quick. My boot deployment. Uh, dun, 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 there we go. OK. You can see this is what a deployment YAML looks like to get this thing running Kubernetes. The first thing you do is give it a name, right? This is, I'm going to call it my boot. I try to keep everything the same. And it has this label of my boot. So the deployment has a label. I want one my boot running, OK? The label selector is also my boot. So this is where it gets a little bit verbose. It seems like I'm saying my boot a lot. That's because the deployment has labels. The, uh, the actual pods that get created have labels too. All right, so this is the pod label. And then, I, and well, the pod label's here, actually. And then we have the concept of the image that I'm going to be using and the port that has to expose. So really, what really matters here is this concept of what image is going to be run and what port, uh, what port do you want to expose. OK? So I say kubectl uh, create. Wait, first, let's see, get namespaces. Or let's figure out what namespace I'm in. Uh, kubectl create namespace. Let's create one real quick to have a place to play. Uh, let's call this my devox. Just kind of make it different. Cube ns my devox. Just because you create it doesn't mean you're in it. So now I'm in it. Uh, that's one thing that's a little bit tricky there. So now I'm in it with cube ns. So I can say cube and let's just back up a directory. Cube cuddle create dash f cube files my boot deployment dot yaml. All right, and let's come over here. Watch cube ctl get all. 
Okay, looks like nothing is really running. Let's see if this works as I hope it will. There we go. So by the creation of the deployment, you can see I got a deployment. I've got a pod all ready to go. And if my window was a little bit bigger, you'd see I'd have a replica set too. There we go. So I basically have now created those three objects just by that one deployment YAML. And now it's running in Kubernetes. Okay, I do need to create a service. So kubectl create dash f cube files my boot service. And now we have a service. And there you can see the service is now in there. Okay, and the service has this node port exposed. And now I can do some fun stuff with it. I can say curl. All right, let's do this mini cube IP. All right, so curl 192.168.99.102.0.0.0. And it was 31.972. There it is. There's a Spring Boot application now running in Kubernetes. So it, it's really a, a couple simple steps, even if you do it all manual. So this is the full manual way that should work across any cluster, no fancy tooling at all. I just took the fat jar, right? Got a Docker image out of it. That might be tricky if your Docker daemon is not available to you. You got to get that image created. And then you basically run your deployment and you have it. And now you can have a little fun with this. So let me come in here and say kubectl. Edit the deployment, my boot. And I have kubectl set up uh, to run Visual Studio Code as my editor. By default, it's just like a VI environment like you get with Git. So just keep that in mind. Let's see here. And I, I that trick, by the way, is cube editor right there. So you basically define an environment variable called cube editor. And in my case, I mapped it to code. And this dash w says uh, the. Um, uh, open a new window, all right? So that means I can now use a, an editor of my choice to do some editing here. But let's say I want three replicas. I'm going to hit Save, close that, watch what happens. I now have three app servers running, OK? They're now all running. And so what's cool about that, let's see if this works for me. Oop, I didn't want to do that, sorry. Back, 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 moving too fast. OK, let's curl it, curl it, curl it, curl it. Notice, look what happened there with the zero. OK, because it's on a different computer. OK, so this is the host name that Java sees, right? This is the host name. That one maps to this one right here, OK, that pod right there. And you can kind of see it starts at 0, because it's the first time anybody's interacted with that JVM. Uh, and if I come over here and run a curl a couple more times, there's another 0, OK? That one right there is this one right here. First time anyone touched that JVM. So that's why I actually like having that little environment variable in there, because I can kind of watch the load balancing occur across the different, different JVMs. Okay, and you kind of see it's kind of random as far as load balancing goes. This there, in this case, it went back to the original one, which is that guy right there. So again, each of these JVMs all running on 8080, all thinking they're uniquely owning their machine. That's the beautiful part about the Linux container, the beautiful part about running in a Kubernetes at scale architecture. I can declaratively say, I want a lot more of these things to run. Okay, so that level of elasticity is pretty powerful all by itself. If I want to come back and say, kubectl edit deployment my boot, and I want to come up here and change something else, like we could. Like we could add labels as an example. You can see there's the label right there. But let's say I just want to go back to one. OK, uh, you might want to change the type of rolling update. You can kind of see there was other things that were added for me that I didn't have to worry about. OK, but let's do the, let's just make it one. Go back here. Because I said one, it takes two of them down. It's actually removing those two things. I'm no longer using the CPU and memory associated with them. Uh, but I still have a working application. Oh. I did. I keep doing that. Let's go back to a curl. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. There's my curl, and it's the original one that was running, and I'm only dealing with one now. Okay. So that is kind of the point of that pattern that I mentioned. Of you basically have to have your right. You got to build your image. You got to have your deployment YAML, your service YAML, and you're ready to go. Okay. So that's what it takes there. And then so building your images can come in a lot of different ways. I use Docker build primarily as a way to build an image, but you can use something like Fabricate or Jib. There's an example of Fabricate and Jib in the, in the GitHub repo. Uh, and I don't have an example of Helm charts, though that's a very popular option as well. Okay? Uh, and I'm still working on some examples of Docker and Podman, or sorry, Builda and Podman, uh, but those only run on Linux distributions from Red Hat right now. I'm trying to get them to port it also to Windows and Mac, because that tends to be where a developer lives, right, on a Mac or a Windows machine. Uh, Kaneko comes from the uh, Google team, as I mentioned earlier. Okay. In the case of the Fabricate Maven plugin, you would just do something like, see the setup command right here? And then Fabricate Deploy, which is kind of cool. All right, meaning you'd basically no Docker file, no YAMLs, just run. And it'll try to make the right assumptions that it can. All right, 
Now, there's one important element to know about Java running in Docker. This is an important tip that you guys should walk out of here with, and that is, by default, the JVM does not respect the container constraints placed upon it. The JVM was built long before J uh, virtual machines became popular. Okay? It was built long before Linux containers became popular and were even known to exist. The JVM assumed that it was going to be installed on a nice four-core, 64-megabyte machine <laughs> you know, back in the late 90s, and it was going to own the whole machine. That's what the JVM was built to do. It's called Java Virtual Machine for a reason. It's its own VM, right? So that's one thing that's a bit of a gotcha in Java. You just have to be aware of it, and you just have to be aware of how to work around it, OK? So by default, if you just simply say, use a, a constraint, like a memory constraint here with Docker Run, or use it within Kubernetes, it will blow out its memory by default, because it assumes it has access to all the memory. So let's try to let's have a little fun with that, OK? Let's, kinda, let's go poke at this guy. All right, so we still have our one pod running right there, OK? And actually, let's, let's streamline this a little bit, so get pods. All right, so there's our pod running, OK? And if I come over and curl it, I have another endpoint on it called re sys resources. Look how much memory and cores it thinks it has, OK? Let's go look at the code real quick. And this is sys resources. It's just simply doing runtime, get runtime, max memory. That's how much heap it thinks it has, and available processors. So it thinks it has access to all the CPUs that I've given it, because I've only given it two. That's defined here, right there, two, two processors. And it's basically that 1.3 1, 1 megabytes, or right there. It, uh, yeah, it's based on the fact that, I'm um, oh, sorry, that's 1.3 gigabytes. It's basically you know, about 25% of the total memory. So that's how much you have available for heap. So it's, that's its default calculation, right? It's the standard thing for Java, basically say, OK, how much memory do I think I have, and, and how many available processors? And then we have another method that it called consume. OK, and what consume does is it basically uses an immutable string and just tries to use up to 80% of the memory it thinks it has. That's all. And so it's pretty straightforward what's happening here. But let me do this. Uh, let's do this while, while true. OK, do. Curl, grab this one. No, not that one. This one. All right. Ah. OK. Make it easier for myself. I'll just copy it out of here. Uh, so like I said, I do have all these things documented. Uh, is it not that one? Yeah, here we go. Right. A while true. Where did I put that one? While true. True. There we go. So let's just do this. I'm going to just copy and paste from here. There. OK, so there's the Spring Boot app that we're talking to right there. And what I want to do is just grab this little curl command. I'll just come down to this other bottom window here. All right, so there it is. And sys resources. Let's double check that. There's how much memory it is. And let's just call the consume method now on it. Now, this is actually, well, uh, now I think about it, it's actually OK, because I've not actually applied the container constraint yet. So I forgot a step there. Let's do that real quick. Yep. OK, notice there's, a, there's two different Docker files here. I'm going to ignore those for now. But I'm going to come over here to look at my cube files again. All right, there's my boot resources, my boot deployment resources, to kind of let you see what that looks like. My boot deployment resources. What it is, it simply has a resource request and a resource limit. So it's very much like what the deployment you saw earlier. But basically, how much memory does it want up front? And is there a node available in the scheduler, in the Kubernetes cluster, to basically schedule that request, requested load? And then what is the overall limit? And this is actually a hard limit. Okay, So I can come over here and say, queue deployments. Look at that one. I can say, queue cuddle replace. We're going to replace that deployment that we had earlier, and uh, my boot deployment resources, replace it, uh, get pods. You'll see that pod getting recycled. All right, and we have a new one up and running. Let's loop against it again. All right, so there it is. You notice again it went to zero, because basically on the concept that I changed the deployment, it, of course, terminates the old pod and recreates the new pod under the new request, right? So basically, this pod now has those container constraints. Let's see here. 
and then see what happens there. Okay, so when I try to basically say use up to 80% of the memory it thinks it has available, if you watch carefully, it went to OOM killed. In other words, and there's a new pod that was born, and notice it started back at zero. So now this is an important element to understand. Kubernetes by default is trying to keep the desired state that you've requested running at all times. I said I want one replica of this image running somewhere in the cluster, and it basically restarted that pod for me. And the, the, here's one thing that's kind of cool about this. I've showed this to a lot of different people at this point, and I had one senior manager talk to me about this and said, this is awesome. My developers write really bad code that uses all the memory. And this means it'll restart automatically. Yeah. And actually, when you see the liveness probe and readiness probe, you can actually be very clever about your readiness probe. Like in one case, I have an example where I show how we basically ensure that all the in-memory session state is replicated to the new pod before the old pod is torn down. Therefore, you can have full in-memory state, like traditional JSF, JSP session state, like we used to use back for our shopping carts back in the day. And it's all good, OK? Because you basically determine when the rolling update can occur, right, with a readiness probe. But this means is for all those programs you wrote and deployed in production where it eats its thread pool, never, you know, you forget the finally block and you don't you put the thread back in the thread pool or the connection back in the connection pool, and the application is still running, the JVM is still up, but it won't respond at all, this will fix that too. It'll restart it for you automatically. So let's see here, we're running this guy, running here. Let's actually hit it again. Again, look at the sys resources. It still thinks it's got 1.3 gigs of RAM and two cores. So even though the constraints were applied, the JVM is completely oblivious to it by default. And if I hit consume, again, it blows up the JVM and it goes OM killed, out of memory killed. Because the real point of this is, let's go here, kubectl get pods, okay? Is that this guy, kubectl exec IT, pod identifier, bin bash, all right, and actually I'm gonna look back at my notes here to make sure we do this correctly. Is this step, uh, we're in step three, we're moving fast here. So step three, open that one up. Okay, so notice I basically have exec into it, just like you see there, and I can also do things like ps-ef based on this one. You can kind of see there's the JVM process that's running. I can say java-version, okay. Notice I'm interacting with it inside of it, by the way, so curl localhost uh, colon 8080. And now that's 26. You notice 26 should get skipped here, and it did, because I burned that number right internally. But I can see my Java, uh, Java version there. Uh, I can see I'm on one, uh, 181 as far as the micro number goes. And then I can look at other things, uh, like I can look and see what operating system this is running. OK, it's running a Debian one based on what the image I grabbed. OK, I can look at free memory. That's also good to know. All right, so it looks like you notice, and here's actually an important point. Free is also wrong. So it's one thing to blame the JVM for being wrong, but a Linux utility is also wrong. It doesn't have 4.4 gigs of available memory to it. It was constrained to 400 meg, okay? So f don't use free as your, as your way to say, wait a second, things aren't quite right here. Um, so go here, and if you look at, this is where C group stores its internal constraints, right? So realistically, it's not Kubernetes that's doing this, and it's not Docker doing this either. It's actually C groups that is doing this, right? It's a Linux thing that's in saying, how much, what is your actual real memory constraint? Uh, and so when I set that up, uh, let's actually go, it's this limit in bytes right here, okay? Uh, right there. So you can kind of see, that's how many bytes it has access to. That's basically the 4, 000, uh, 400 meg I gave it inside the deployment YAML. So if I come over here, to cube files, I wanted to show you that YAML file one more time so we're all aware of it. But if you look here, I basically said this, my deployment like I had earlier, the difference is I have these constraints. You're limited to one core and you're limited to 400 megs of RAM. All right? And that file you see right there, uh, right here, inside the actual container. So that's an important thing to understand. The JVM is not picking that up by default. However, there is a way to make it pick it up by default, and that is if I come over here and use experimental options. Wait. Uh, da, 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 da. If I get these two commands, all right, Java, 
that paste in correctly? There we go. Notice now the calculation is 112 megs of RAM. So in other words, it's going back to that quarter calculation, about 25% or so, like it had earlier, but instead of using all the memory on the VM, it's using just the memory that it was constrained to within the actual container constraint. Now you might be thinking, and I have heard this a lot, well, we're just not going to put that in my deployment YAML. That's a lot of developers are like, I'm going to skip that step. I don't have to worry about this JVM thing blowing up. Your operations team will put it back. Okay, because they're not going to give you unlimited room to run your application. They're not going to let you give unlimited memory and unlimited CPUs all on that host. Because often when you deploy a Kubernetes node, you're not deploying it to a little tiny Raspberry Pi, though you can. You're deploying it to a big honking machine and running it on a public cloud provider or on a big data center server. In other words, that machine may have 128 gigs of RAM and 16 cores. And you should not eat all of it for your one little application. So they're going to actually apply these container constraints, if not in the deployment YAML, in the namespace itself, in which case you're still going to have to abide by them. All right, so just being aware of this is important because by default it does blow up. Okay, uh, let's see here. And, and actually, let's see what happens here. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know if you noticed, I was actually inside that pod and I just ran consume on it, which means it got killed and it threw me out. Uh, so <laughs> get kubectl get pods. And uh, it's here. All right, so that guy was OM killed. Now, you can also see the crash loop black off is another thing you'll see a lot in a Kubernetes architecture. In this case, it's simply basically saying back off for a second without trying to restart that. Okay, it's going to take a few minutes to restart or a few seconds to restart. Notice the number of restarts. That's an important number for you to understand as well. Why is it restarting? You should be kind of looking into that. And if I come over here and get the pods, cube, cuddle, describe, pod, okay? So the describe command is an important one for you. I can kind of come over here and look at it, and it'll tell me some information about it, right? There's the resource constraints that I applied through the deployment YAML. One, what was the last time it restarted due to OM kill, okay? Get, you can get some information about why that pod is misbehaving, okay? And there's the port number and things like that, and the image name. Okay, so why, why did it die? You can also describe your deployment. And deployment, my boot, and, and see some inf information about it as well. Again, the deployment provides the template, right? So the, this, they call it the pod spec template. And so basically the image name, the port number, again, those constraints, you can kind of see what it is there. But this helps you know, did the cube cuddle create dash F or apply dash F, you use the apply verb, did it actually take effect over on the actual object running in memory? Okay, so on that deployment artifact. All right, let's keep going here. You guys still okay? Have we, have we worn you out yet? All right, we got a lot more to go. Okay, so we kind of showed you a little bit about this already. You basically can SSH into your container and poke around. This is a very powerful t capability if you're trying to figure out why is it not behaving correctly. As a matter of fact, I want to get into that actual uh, machine, right, that into that actual container, and as you saw me do earlier, I can basically just run Java from the command line and see what's going on. Like, what version of the JVM is it really running? Because I don't know where I pulled that image from. How is it set up? I can look at the logs directly associated with that application server. I can maybe figure out why why it can't find the database it's supposed to connect to, can I ping it, you know, things like that. So it gives you a nice tool for basically understanding why is our things not running correctly, okay? If you can kind of get in there. So it's the exec command, exec-it, and then you'll see me use like a bin bash. You can also um, run commands directly, right? Like you can see here, you can kind of run this concept here, uh, basically looking at that limited bytes from consta uh, container constraint standpoint. And so that's a very powerful way to go figure out what's going on inside the actual container, all right? Uh, there's a lot of other things you can do in there, but one thing I'd caution you to think about is don't, don't do this in a production environment. It's easy for you to take down the pod once you're inside the pod. And you know, in other words, you might start a process that basically uses the rest of the available memory, and of course it gets killed again, as an example. You don't really want to start two JVMs inside that uh, container. You want to hopefully get the one that you wanted running, running. And so there's things you don't really want to mess around in there from a production setting standpoint, but for development, I use it all the time. Now, like, why is that application not running, as an example? We'll go ahead and just kind of, we kind of did that rather quickly, uh, but let's go ahead and talk about logs next, because I think logging gets to be interesting. Okay, uh, kubectl get pods. If I come over here, you can kind of see there's my pod that's running, kubectl logs. 
and let's look at the logs associated with it. So you can kind of see there's the logs, uh, the Spring Boot logging. You can see the com burst setter, my rest controller health, okay? You can kind of see slash health, slash consume, slash resources. These things have all been called. That is the logs associated with it. So cube, cuddle, logs. That's pretty straightforward by itself. But there are some other tips you should be aware of, okay? One is this concept of dash P. So if you have a failing pod, for some reason the pod is just not coming up, okay? And that's going to be a common thing. Uh, the, it can't connect to its database, and therefore it keeps failing over. It can't basically, for some reason, run something in particular. Dash P says, look at the last failed pod and pull the logs from it. Okay, last failed pod, meaning I want to see what's failing and understand that better. There is also a couple other great tools that I like using a lot. Okay? Now, one thing to understand is you notice I do system out print line up there. Anything that goes to standard out is available to the logs. So always log to standard out. If you log to a file, then you have to come up with another way to get that file exported to make it visible. If you log to standard out, that means anything that you have running in your Kubernetes cluster that does the log aggregation. For instance, a lot of people use EFK, Elastic, Search, FluentD, Kibana, right? It'll grab all those logs from standard out and aggregate them for you in a central location, or uh, ELK, log stash, instead of FluentD. But FluentD is the default in the Kubernetes ecosystem. But you can kind of see, I can say kubectl logs, but I can also use this thing called kubetail, which is nicely tailing the logs. But there's also stern and kale. And I like stern a lot. Uh, and that's one of my favorites right now. So I can, with stern, I can say stern my boot. And I can basically, and now I'm monitoring my boot. Okay, so stern my boot. And if I come over here and run my, I guess I can, let's run this consume again. All right. Okay, we killed it, and notice it said my boot killed. <laughs> okay, we killed it, but it should be coming back to life. Get pods. All right, see it says OM killed, but it should come back online. Come on, come on, restart that pod. And so it should be restarting. Okay, so it's trying to get events. This is another good tip. Get events basically will show you what is happening from the Kubernetes cluster standpoint. You can kind of see it's trying to restart that container. Um, and let's see. All right. Trying to, trying to. Notice also the zero of one. So basically, this is an important thing to understand also, uh, is I have zero available and ready. That's an important statistic to look at. If you're dealing with an Istio environment where there's two containers in that pod, you'll see two of two. Right or one of two, and until you're two of two, you know you're not ready to go. So it looks like it brought my pod back up finally. Okay, my pod came back up, and notice Stern starts logging automatically, because Stern is just looking for anything that matches the my boot phrase, which is kind of awesome. You can also do something like this with Kale. Okay, so let me show you Kale, and uh, and you can basically say cube ns. Let me see what name space I'm in. So Kale, my DevOps. Is it, is it dash in? I sometimes forget what it is. There we go. OK, and let's try consume. There we go. I killed it again. Uh, cube cuddle, get pods. All right, so again, I killed it one more time. But notice what Kale. Kale allows you to kind of look at all the logs across the entire namespace. So if you're dealing with a lot of microservices, where I might have four or five or six things calling each other, I can use Stern or Kale as a way to say, let me look at the logs across everything, because I'm not sure where the problem is. So I really like those two tools. So those are good tips for you guys to be aware of, Stern and Kale. Uh, and you can see it's trying to bring my little pod back online there. And I'm curious to see how long it'll take. One thing, one thing you'll notice, too, especially on a system that's kind of overloaded like mine is right now, it takes a little bit longer for those subsequent restarts if you're really abusing it like I am right now and beating it up. Uh, so you can see it's taking a little bit longer on that crash loop back off. It should have access to the image, because we didn't change anything about that. But you will sometimes see that it can't find the container image. In this case, it did, right? A container image already present on the machine. Uh, and then. Let's see here. Oop, not that window. And there we go. And you can see it's the back off is basically, basically it, it tries. And then it's, if it can't get it going, it kind of backs off for a second or two and gives it another go. So it's still trying to get that pod restarted. We'll come back to it in a second and see if it's happened. 
All right, so the logs are very powerful. Just be aware that you can use stern, kale, great little tools for that. And then there's also one called cube tail, as well as just cube cuddle logs. But remember this dash P, last failed pod. Uh, also with kale, you can do a look back, look back over the last hour. Show me all the logs over the last hour, which is awesome. Um, you know, you can kind of do things like that. Okay. Environment variables and config maps. Whew, I told you we got a lot of things to cover here. All right. So the one key thing to understand is I mentioned that you don't have to have a configuration type solution per se, because there's one that's built into Kubernetes. This may or may not meet your needs, but it is nice if you think of 12-factor apps, right? The concept of the app config is separate from the application code. Therefore, if you move it from development to production, you know things like your database connection string will change. You know that your JMS broker identifier will change. The user ID and password, or whatever it might be. Those kinds of things can be externalized into, let's say, properties files or into some other externalized reference point that you can then update and also store in version control. Right? That's kind of the idea. So you have two things within Kubernetes out of the box. One is just environment variables that you can manipulate. And the other is this thing called a config map. Okay? So let's show you that one. I'm just going to open this up. And again, all this is in GitHub. Everything I'm showing, I've documented. And I've tried to make it you know, as clear as possible that, so you can follow along and do this as homework. I'm hoping, is anyone going to try this as homework at all, you think? Only one of you? I've not done my job if only a few of you think this is worth the homework. OK? You got to be thinking, OK, this is kind of fun stuff. I want to try it on my own. All right, so let's go over here to that little Spring Boot app I had earlier. Notice that it has this thing called configure. OK? And I have this concept of a get database environment, get property. I want the DB connection. I want the message broker. I want this thing called greeting. I want this thing called love. And I just use that configuration parameter to call it. It looks like my pod is running again. That's good. Uh, cube cuddle get services. What was that node port? OK, good. Node port notice stays is basically the same. Uh, so 192, 168. Oh, I've already forgotten already. What was the IP address? Uh, Minikube IP. So I use these tools a lot. Oh, it was 99, 102 for this one. And then 31972. Yep. And then that was called uh, configure. Right. So right now, it basically says default, default, default. Because I've not said anything at all. OK? There's no environment variable set for any of those things at, at this point in time. And so I can set them using another command. You can kind of see right here. And actually, let's do this real quick. Let's scale things up. It might be more fun if we scale things up. OK? I'm just kind of picking and choosing there. But watch what happens when I say I want two of those. You can kind of see there's a new one being born right there. OK? Uh, you can actually scale these things up. And then, of course, you can take them down. No, no big deal there. Configure, we showed you that. Now let's actually set one of these environment variables. And also watch what happens. I'm going to set the environment variable. And notice the two are killed, and the new ones are being born. So that's an important thing to understand when it comes to changing your environment. It assumes you're going to recycle the pod. It assumes you're going to restart that JVM. Uh, and that is an important element to understand, because you might not want to do this in a production environment all that often, right? Because you've taken everything down. But if you notice, love equals aloha now. Okay. So if I'm going to come up here and basically call something else like greeting, And I want to call this uh, howdy. OK, you'll notice that, again, it's going to create new pods. Again, I had two replicas, so two are coming up. And then it's going to have to tear down the old one. And so if we come over here and now look at the curl command one more time, there's howdy, greeting, and love, aloha. So if I come in over here and look at the kubectl edit, edit deployment, kubectl edit deployment, uh, my boot. Remember this trick as well? There's the environment variable set inside it. OK? So I can basically determine that I want to set those environment variables right up from the get-go in the deployment YAML as I deploy it. Or I can manually, in, from an imperative standpoint, add them on the fly, as you saw me do here. This would not, again, not be what you want to do from a production environment. You would just simply have these things, let's say, externalized into their own file. And therefore, you just edit the one file for production versus staging versus dev versus something else, if that's what you wanted. So that's really where a config map comes into play. Okay? And if you want to unset these variables, you can kind of just come in here and see the minus sign. So I can come over here and let's, let's close this guy, because he's waiting for him to close. Okay? I can copy. There we go. 
Unset love. Again, you see it tearing it down. Unset greeting. And again, you'll see it tear it down. Okay? So just, you're going to have to be cognizant of that. But there's this concept of a config map. Okay? And you notice it says create CM, my config, from environment file, config some properties. So let's go look at config. Let's bring up the editor. All right? Some properties. There I have greeting and love set up as just little key value pairs. I also have this other one called other properties what may be a database connection message broker. And basically your config map basically will load the configuration from those property files. Now there's a lot of different ways to mess with your config map. You can kind of go crazy with it, have a lot of fun with it. Um, but you can see it's a pretty straightforward command. I can say create config map, some properties. Okay. Get CM. Now I have a config map out there. Cube cuddle. Uh, and notice also when I'm using cube cuddle, cube control, and get, right? I can just say get pods, get CM, get deployment get service. Basically, all of these guys are just objects that I'm interacting with, right? I can say get services, uh, right? And so get CM. A couple other things you should be aware of. I can also say I want to see the YAML version of that object. So notice I did the O YAML there, and I can look inside it. Uh, I can also export it as JSON. All right. And then, oh, let's see if here, t -t 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 YAML. Is that the right command? And if you actually use the dash export, you can now have an artifact that you can basically put in your version control. So in other words, you can mess around with this thing and decide, okay, I got it where I want it to be, finally, messing around with it, and then export the YAML from it as well. So that might be a way to kind of get started if you're kind of still new to figuring out what the YAML should be, uh, and that might be a nice thing for you. But so if we look at our Git CM, uh, let's see, what does describe do for me? Describe CM my config. All right, there we go. So we have, uh, we have our greeting, which is hujumbo, if you're in Swahili, down in Kenya or the east coast of Africa, and love is a more, okay? Um, but let's go look at our little application. So minikube IP, and, and cube cuddle get service. That was our node port. I can say curl, right? 192, let's just copy this. And colon, and then 31972. Okay, uh, configure. And you notice it did not apply yet. All right, that's an important thing to understand. Because just because I created the config map does not mean my deployment is aware of the config map. So I want to kind of show you that because that can be very confusing. It has gotten me multiple times, right? It's like, uh, okay, I made the config map. How come that configuration is not showing up? And so you actually have to have a different deployment YAML. Okay. Let's go over here. So we looked at the resource one. Let's look at the configuration one. We have, again, notice we have the constraints we had earlier. Okay, We have the port number and the image that we had earlier. But now we can basically say, get your environment from the config map. So this means you can, separate, you can change the config map separate from the deployment. Okay, uh, So I want to come over here now and say, cube cuddle. Watch what happens also. My replicas here is one. That's important to note, because right now I have replicas set at two, but I'm going to overlay cube cuddle replace dash f cube files uh, my boot deployment, and this one is called configuration. I'm going to replace that one. It's going to kill the two old pods based on the previous deployment and build new pods, and in this case, it's only going to give me one. Okay, because it's only giving me one because I said one replica. And let's see here. I'm going to go back to curl. So I did my curl command. Notice I didn't change this port number, the node port, because that's tied to the service. Even though the pods have been recycling, that's tied to the service. So if we look here at the service, by the way, cube kettle, get services. This is an important thing to understand. All right, you can see there it is. There's the cluster IP associated with it. There's a node port. We've been looking at that. But let's do this. Describe service, my boot. Look right here. Look at the endpoints. Okay? You can have, depending on the number of replicas you have, actually, let's spin up another replica. Uh, cube cuddle, edit deployment, my boot. All right, let's kind of, let's go at three here. Close that down. Okay, cube cuddle, get pods. There should be three of them coming up. All right, describe. And let's just look at one of these pods real quick. 
There we go. All right. Look here. All right. See the IP address of the pod? Okay. Let me come back over here and describe my service one more time. Notice there's three IP addresses there, all on 8080. And here is 11 for one of those pods. And that's this guy here in the middle. So the concept of endpoints, meaning the service is automatically picking up pods to meet its mat, uh, label selector and including it behind that load balancer. So that's kind of where how the magic happens is this concept of the endpoints. And basically for every pod that meets the label selection, it shows up. Okay. So in this, the label selector is this app my boot. If I come over here and say cube, cube, cuddle get pods, show labels, app my boot. All right, the fact that they have a matching label is what it means to be part of that label selector, which is part of that service. Okay, so now we got those guys up and running. Uh, we have all of them, and we can look at the, let's go back and look at the configure command again. Okay, you kind of see that we have, and if you notice, I have that, that's a different pod from the one I did here. Okay, and you can see it still has that same configuration. So everybody now has the same configuration, and that's just one nice way to kind of deal with configuration is the concept of config maps. Okay? All right, we do it on time. All right, we only have about one hour left. You guys still with me? We're getting to the good stuff now. Okay? Was that, has this been fun so far? Okay, but let's show you kind of the real fun stuff. Uh, and we're gonna get to more of the hard stuff at this point. So I mentioned earlier we got things like Istio and we got you know you know Kubernetes running everywhere, but you got to still understand things like service balancing, uh, service discovery and load balancing, and then the lives probe and readiness probes to really understand how Kubernetes is operating. So by default, service discovery is just based on a name, DNS entry. So I can basically call it customer, call it producer in this case, call it HR, call it whatever I want. I just refer to that string, and that's all I have to do. So if I'm using Rust template from Spring, I simply just refer to it by name. So you don't have to have a service discovery mechanism like Eureka or Zookeeper or something else and do a lookup. You don't have to. Okay, you can because you might have services that live completely outside your Kubernetes cluster. That's when you might have to have some form of Zookeeper or Eureka or some other service discovery mechanism. And for most of us, we work in large organizations. There is some form of service discovery solution that you guys have already worked hard on and you still want to use. I appreciate that. But by default, you get this for free within the cluster, okay? So the concept that you can refer to it by name is an important element, but because you can refer to it by name, you can kind of do some really fun stuff. So if I look over here at this Java code, let's, let's close some of these things down so I don't get too confused here. Yeah, let's close that down, okay? And you can kind of see it has this thing called calling another. And it's gonna call my node, the service my node, in a space called your space. And so if you do go cross namespace, you do have to say the name of the namespace. Otherwise, you can just call it by the service name. So I'm going to deploy a Node.js service and have this Java application call that Node.js service. Okay? Uh, again, I have all the instructions listed here. Let's go back here over here. And for this, this kind of setup here for service discovery. And you can kind of see we're going to create a new namespace right here. I'm just going to come down to this window here. Create a new namespace. Oh, it helps if you're in the right directory. Uh, there we go. All right. And if I come over here and look at Node.js, I have this little Node.js application. Uh, if I come over here and hit npm start, curl localhost 8000, it's pretty straightforward, right? It's hello Node.js, and you can kind of see the one, two, three, four. Okay, no big deal there. And I can basically test it locally. That's just what you saw me do. And I can do a Docker build on it now. So I'm going to do a Docker build. Do my, remember the pattern is right. You got to get your base image. You got to do your Docker build. I can say Docker images now. Grep, nine steps. Okay, you kind of see this is the my node v1 I just created right here. Where is it? <laughs> my node latest. Oh, what did I use? V1. Okay, why it says 14 hours ago, I'm not sure. Sometimes that time does show up kind of oddly. Okay, so I have that. Uh, I, and actually, by the way, because the Docker daemon is exposed, I can say docker run dash it. Let's double check to make sure that I have what I think I have. Okay, just in case something might have messed up here. Nine steps, awesome. My node v1. All right, we're now going to run it there. And remember my minikube IP address again. This is running inside the minikube VM. Okay, 
And so I can say curl. I can talk to this guy. 80, oh, nope. 8080. All right. So 8080? Oh, it's on 8000. It would help if I remember that. OK. Uh, <laughs> 8000. Here we go. There. And curl it on 8000. There we go. So there it is. That, there's my little Node.js application. And now I have to do the same pattern as we saw with Java. I need to have the deployment YAML and service YAML. So you can kind of see, here's my deployment YAML. And we'll add it to your space. Uh, cube. Look at my cube NS, though. I'm still in my DevOx. All right, there is your space, but I'm not actually using it yet. Uh, so let's go here. All right, we're going to do our deployment. And we're going to do our service. OK, cube cuddle get pods dash in your space. All right, so there's my node running. And if I do get services, OK, there's the node port for it. So curl 192.168.99.102 and 31411. All right, there's the hello node.js. OK, now it's running as a pod. OK. Uh, but because of that, I can now talk to it, OK? Because now we have Node.js running. In theory, I can go back to my Java application now and talk to that Node.js application. And if you look at the code, it's, again, very straightforward. My node, your space. And so we put my node. That's kubectl get services. My node, OK? And it's in your space. That's really the trick to it. So curl, get kubectl, get services in my devox. OK, so curl 192.168.168.99.102.31. So I'm actually calling my boot. Calling another is that method, I think, if I got that right. Calling another. All right. So I'm actually talking to the Spring Boot application, but it's actually returning from Node.js. Let's look at Stern. Uh, I'll actually do this. Kale dash in uh, your space. Don't know if I have any logging. I don't have any logging inside that Node.js application. But you, basically, I'm calling through the Java application into the Node.js application. Uh, so Stern, my boot. Let's see if that's, there we go. So you can kind of see for the Spring Boot application is calling into Node.js. All right? So that's one thing nice about service discovery. It's very straightforward. You don't have to worry about it. It's kind of thing built in. Again, if you do go outside the cluster, though, you can actually set up a service without endpoints. You can set up a service that basically is a proxy, if you will, for some external service outside the cluster. So you can do that sort of thing, too. Uh, but by default, if it's a service within the cluster, it's automatically available through DNS. OK? Lots of fun stuff here. Kind of walks you through that. But let's keep moving. we got more cool things to show you. OK, the live and readiness probe. So this is where the, really the magic of Kubernetes really starts to happen. And I know it's kind of hard to read right here, but let's kind of look, look at this a little bit more. You have this concept of liveness probe and readiness probe that you put on your deployment YAML file. In other words, you basically identify as the developer or architect who's deploying this thing, what are the checks that make sure that I am good or not good? So there are two separate checks, and ready comes after live. So live goes first. If you're not live, meaning you don't return a valid like 200 to live, or valid answer to live, Kubernetes assumes you're dead, that you're just a walking zombie. It shoots you in the head and starts you someplace else. So you always want to be alive, OK? And if you notice what I did here is I mapped the liveness probe to 8080, my Spring Boot, my Fat Jar application, my Vertex application, my Micro Profile application, path uh, root. In other words, I not only want the virtual machine, right, the container up and running, the machine, I want my JVM up and running. I'm not alive until my JVM is up. That's how I like to think of it. So I, I try to basically map liveness probes to something in the JVM that the JVM can respond to. You can also do things like, let's say this is an old C++ application that doesn't speak HTTP. And as a matter of fact, it's old school C++ or old school COBOL that happens to run on Linux. And what it assumes is that a file shows up in the file system. It reads that file, does its big processing on it, and puts out a new file. You can have your liveness probe mapped to look for the file. 
In other words, your test can be look for a file showing up in this directory of this format and return a good. We're up. So your liveness probe can be almost anything. You will see examples throughout the Kubernetes documentation that just uses files. Does the file exist or not exist? And that's live. But if you're not live, that's the first test. It shoots you and starts you again. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So you always want to return a good answer to live as quickly as possible. <laughs> you can see that it does wait so long for you to return. It uh, pulls you every five seconds. It waits 10 seconds on the initial de you know, deployment, pulls you every five seconds, and uh, you know, waits about two seconds for you to respond. If you don't respond, it assumes you're dead. Okay? The readiness probe is a little bit different in that it also is being pulled on a regular basis. It assumes you're live, but ready means you're ready to receive load. You're ready to receive traffic through the service. Okay? And this is a very important one to get right because I haven't showed you this, but if you're, if you're watching carefully, if I'm actually interacting with all those pods as they're dying and coming back to life, my users are getting error messages. My users are getting 503s in many cases because those pods are being recycled so much. My servers are going down and coming back to life. What I want is a situation where I can do updates to my pods with zero downtime for my users. They see no errors. And the, and the readiness probe is the magic. If you are ready, meaning I return a 200 for ready, that means I have, my JVM is up. I've, the, I've done, you know, I made sure my Spring Boot framework is up or Vertex framework or MicroProfile framework. It doesn't really matter. You know that everything is running properly because it's calling your method, your Java code, your Node.js code, your Python code. And more importantly, you might have connected to your database. You might have warmed up your caches. You might have calculated you know, whatever you've got to calculate, and you've, you know you're ready to receive load. So this is a very powerful concept. And so I've used this trick before for doing things like failing over session state from one pod to another. Because what happens is when you're doing the rolling update in Kubernetes, and when you're bringing up the new pod, it won't tear down the old pod until it knows your new pod is ready. OK? Once your new pod is ready, it tears down the old pod and things fail over. But before that, it waits till you're ready. So it's important that you understand these guys. So let me, let me, let me try to show you right now how this looks. Uh, let's see. Cube, cuddle, describe, deployment, my boot. Let's go back and pick on my boot again. Okay. And notice right now, there's the config map we showed you earlier. There's live, you know, the request and the CPU and all those things. Okay. But there's no live and readiness probe. We've not applied it yet. So let's do this. Let's do. Dun -dun. No, not that one. Wrong window. Not watch. While, do I not have it in there? There we go. Let's do my little loop again. So there it's looping. You see it says who jumbo now because we changed the configuration. Okay. So they, we're looping against it. Let's watch our pods. How many pods do I have running? I got three pods running. Now, let's, let's just mess around with it a little bit. I'm just making this up on the fly, by the way, if you're wondering what's going on. <laughs> let's go here. I'm going to mess around with it. Um, notice I had three replicas. I'm going to tear it down to one. And close. Watch what happens there. Two of them are getting killed. OK. I'm still looping. The good news is my loop didn't see any errors in this case, because it basically was bound to that first one automatically. So that's good. OK, because depending on how, when you mess with these things, when you don't have the liveness probe and readiness probe, you might see errors. So let's actually have a little fun with this. OK, let's go back to, hello, Spring Boot. OK, let's look at this code. And it does have the Hugh Jumbo, let's see, from Spring Boot. I'm just going to make a change here. Put my name in, it's just going to make a difference. OK. Docker images, grep, nine steps. All right, my boot v1. Docker build, dash t, nine steps. Awesome. My boot v2. Oh, wait. Before we do that, we got to first maven clean package. <laughs> it does help when you compile your code and build the fat jar. Uh, and so one thing I always recommend to people is you actually test it real quick, you know, before you throw it into production, right? You should always test your code. So let's test this code real quick. Uh, boot demo, okay. Curl localhost, 8080. All right, there it says from Burr, right? Okay, that's good. That's what I wanted. 
Um, and let's go Docker build now. Docker build dash T, nine steps, awesome. And my boot, V2. I'm gonna have the second Docker image out there now. And nine steps, okay. That cube cuddle, get pods. All right, so there's the one pod. It's still based, obviously, on the first image, not based on the second image, but we can update that. So cube cuddle, edit, deployment, my boot. Let's see if this works for me. There are other ways to do this, but I'm just going to try to hack it uh, to have a little fun with it here. My boot v2. I'm just change the designation there. So notice what happens. I'm getting error messages because it's tearing down the old one as it brings up the new one. Okay, and notice also it says one, running one for one, and there's still a lot of error messages. That's because I don't have the readiness probe. But I was able to roll that image to production rather rapidly, but I did have outages, right? My users would have saw errors. Uh, and we don't necessarily want that, right? You, wanna, you want to make it so they don't have errors. So I can roll back to v1, okay? Uh, there's other commands, by the way, for doing this sort of thing. I'm just kind of doing it by hacking on the deployment. So we'll go back to V1. Again, you notice it's tearing down the old one, bringing up the new one. Again, it thinks the new one is ready, when in fact it wasn't ready. Now it's ready. It takes a second or two for that JVM to come to life. That's kind of the idea. So here's what we're going to do next. We're going to basically replace our deployment with one that has the proper probes in it. Okay? kubectl replace dash f cube files. Replace that. Okay, again, you're going to see our pods redeploy, but notice now it's taking a little time before it goes one for one. It's taking a little time because it's actually running the readiness probe that's in that Java virtual machine that is actually my code. Now we should be good to go, all right? So we're back on version one, but it says from Spring Boot, and you can see it's running right there. And as a matter of fact, let's do this kubectl get uh, edit deployment my boot all right let's just actually kind of crank this up a little bit let's actually have three replicas just to kind of see how that change is all right you know we should spawn three new containers here three new pods again it says it's running but zero for one the one for one is what matters that's when it passes its readiness check Readiness probe, now it's one for one, and then you see it load balancing now. One, two, three, and it's this one right here, is this one right here. Okay, and there's this new one right here. That's this guy right here. Okay, so that's the two new pods that brought to life. And let's go back now and change our image name again. So now we're gonna do a rolling update. Notice it tore one down immediately. It's bringing up these new guys. It does say pending. I might be out of resources, <laughs> so that could be part of a uh, challenge for me. Um, so that's often what pending means. Like uh, you might be out of resources and make that available to run. But let's see if we can get it to roll over anyway. If not, I can just tear down a couple pods. Uh, let's let's do that just to be on the safe side. Let's go to replicas two, because you know you have to have more than three to do the rolling update properly. Let's see if we can get it to spin over. Oh, might just not be enough. Get pods. Because I have a lot of other things running here. Uh, dash in your space. Yeah, so let's delete that uh, Node.js one. Uh, delete namespace, your space. Free up some resources. Okay. Maybe that'll give me a little bit more room. There we go. Gives, I get a little more. I remove this one set of pods, and I have a little bit more room there. Maybe enough to get that guy up. Again, we're looking at the running zero for one. And will it come up? There we go. And it and basically rolled over. And again, it rolled over with no error message. So that is another element. Besides the service and the pod separation, I would say this is another element that really makes Kubernetes shine. The fact that you have control as the developer slash architect to determine when you are ready is a massive, massive win. And we had lots of ways we did this with old app server technology. You know, we had our own solutions for this sort of clustering in, in old up school app servers. But the fact that this works on anything, Node.js, Python, Java, whatever, is kind of awesome. Okay? 
And you guys actually get a chance to see me have to debug a problem there. The pending, that tells me I ran out of resources someplace. Let me try to clean up, because I actually have a bunch of other stuff running here. Uh, kubectl, get pods, all namespaces. Uh, there we go. I've got a bunch of other things running too. All right, so that little VM, I started running out of resources. Okay, let's kind of look at that code. It's calling slash health. Okay, slash health basically is returning, you know, 200. I'm okay, as long as it returns 200. And you can put whatever you want to in here. Like in this case, you can see there's a little bit of logic that's commented out that says, oh, every, you know, every, if you're less than five, you know, return a un unavailable. <laughs> you know, maybe randomly return some errors just to see if your system is behaving correctly. And so if it's not healthy, it's out of the load balancing pool. If it is healthy, it's in the load balancing pool. Pretty straightforward. Okay, make sense? All right, fun stuff there. Uh, let's see. Let's go. I just want to go look at that file again real quick. And that is, and all I've done, if you notice, I've kind of went from the base deployment. Let's just walk through those again real quick. The base deployment had basically nothing more than my name, the image name, and the port number. And then we kind of went up to one with resource constraints right there. Then we went to one that was configuration based, right? Config map as another example, and then we went to another one that had the live and redness probe. So we're kind of just building up our deployment YAML with the capabilities we want to see, and you kind of see this maps to slash health, this map to the root, and as long as those return 200s, you're good to go, okay? At any point they stop returning 200s, then you got to know that you're dealing with that. Now, uh, there's another one called Canary we might be able to get to here in a second. Uh, what else? I think that's mostly it, My, mostly it, so when it comes to this, this little example. All right, let's get back in here. Okay, we're, ch we're showing all our nine steps. I think we're doing okay on time. All right, rolling updates, blue-green deployment. You just actually saw a rolling update. That's kind of what I simulated right there. The concept of having your live and readiness probe in place means you can change the image identifier, and there's lots of commands to change the image identifier. I just did the edit on the deployment YAML, but you could also, there's other commands to do a rollout or a rollback, and you'll see it go through that rolling update process. Again, you have to have more than enough available memory because I, you saw it actually got stuck on me there because it was trying to use more memory than I had available. Uh, but it will try to keep your state that you require intact during a rolling update. But you can also do some really fun stuff with like a blue-green deployment or, or a canary deployment. Let's go look at that file real quick. Again, everything's documented out here on GitHub. Hopefully you guys have checked that out. I also have little polling tools and things like that. Like there's a little uh, poll, my node, my boot. Okay, dun, 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 right? So instead of remembering the watch command, I might be able to pull. And actually, it looks for MySpace. And I actually put that in my DevOps. Let's go here. Oop, oop. Pull my boot. And it's basically looking for MySpace, but I call that my DevOps. And so that's going to be a problem. There we go. All right, so there's some other little tools and stuff like that I've added to this uh, that you can kind of go use. And, and if you're dealing with Minishift, Right, there's a slight difference between Minishift versus Minikube. Not much, right? Minishift IP versus Minikube IP. And that's why I have the two different polars there. But let's look at this one called deployment techniques, which is step eight, okay? All right, let's go. I deleted your space earlier. Let's clean things up a little bit. Get pods, okay. Let's actually cube, cuddle, uh, edit, deployment. Let's kind of trim some fat here so I have enough room to play around here. My boot. And replicas one. Okay. All right. We should see one of those pods going away now. All right, good. Get that down to one. And cube, cuddle. Well, actually, let's do this. Okay. We're not going to worry about that right now. So it wants us to go back to your space, which is the one I deleted. This is what I've documented here. <laughs> so let's go ahead. Let's go and bring Node.js back online. How about that? Cube, cuddle, create namespace, your space. So you can, you can create namespaces via the YAML, or you just create them uh, from an imperative command standpoint, namespaces. Again, that is if, if your systems administrator gives you that privilege. OK, so your space. And go back to uh, Node.js, which is running over here. OK, I think I already have my Docker image, though. Should, that shouldn't have been touched. Docker image should still be out here. Uh, my node v1, all right, that's the v1. Okay, uh, so cube create, 
dash f, my node, cool, sorry, I keep those here, my node deployment. Okay, let's get that up. And let's go ahead and just switch over to your space. All right, cube cuddle, get pots. All right, no, get all. Am I not in your space? Ooh, did I delete, put that in the wrong place? Let's see, get cube ns, my devox. Yep, yeah, I put it in the wrong place. Oh well, no worries. <laughs> so I added it to this other namespace. I, that shouldn't be a problem. We'll have to just make do and make, make that work. Okay, so we have our, our different pods. Let's look at our deployments. So I have the my boot and my and my node living in the same place now. Looks like we're right there. Cube cuddle create dash f cube files service. Uh, so my node service. All right, my node and you could get services. We have it right here. This is my node right here. That's the one. So curl 192.168.99.102 and then 301.97. Oh, it helps if you get the nine in there. There we go. So there's the Node.js command or Node.js application. So let's have a little fun with this. Okay, we have that set in place. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, well, let's build a version two of it. Bring this up. So by default, it says hello. We'll come over here and make it say bonjour. All right, let's double check that I did that correctly before we deploy it. And it's 8,000. And now it says bonjour, fantastic. So I'll do a Docker build, dash T, nine steps, awesome. Uh, my node, V2. We're going to make a second Docker image. All right, and there's my node, V1, and my node, V2. Five seconds ago. All right, so that is my node, V2. So we have that out there now. Uh, let's look at the deployment file for that. I just want to double check something. Okay, you can kind of see there's the my node deployment, and there's the my node deployment new. Notice the old one is v1, the new one is v2. You see the difference there? Uh, and that's important because what we're going to do is have a little fun with this thing. So we have our two images now. I'm going to basically make my new deployment. Let's do this. Uh, watch. kubectl get pods. Okay, there's the node. JS up and running alongside the Spring Boot one. Create dash F. Come on. Uh, cube files. My node deployment new. New. All right. Second deployment now coming online. Notice there's a new pod now called my node new. If I basically come over here and do this, where's my little polar? Pull my node. I want to fix this real quick because it's going to have the wrong namespace in it. I have my devox. OK, let's just run this polar. My node. Let's see there. Hello, hello. Notice it only says hello. OK? And that's because while we have two pods, we have one service. Uh, we, have, we have one service. All right, that's the my node service. And it's basically got, you know, on that node port, if we do kubectl describe, my service, uh, service, my node. Remember earlier we talked about the endpoints, right? That's pointing to the one pod that it basically maps to. Because if I come over here and say kubectl get pods, show labels, notice the labels are slightly different. I have my node right here and my node new. So that second deployment gave me a different label. Therefore, it's not part of the load balancer at this point in time. But I've deployed both, OK? I've deployed one versus the other. And let's see if we can kind of show you this real quick. So this is the concept of a blue-green. We'll just walk through these slides real fast. I have both blue and green, my node, my node new. The concept is real simple. I have checked into something to my source code repository. I've done my build. You saw me do the quick build there, if you will. I did my Docker build, but it moves from deployment to QA to staging. 
and it lands on the available slot. So blue and green are actually arbitrary colors. Some people, I've seen people use different colors here. You can pick whatever colors you want, if you know what I mean. It just simply means we have both things running simultaneously side by side, but our users, based on the load balancer, are only seeing the old one. They're not seeing the new one at all. So I get to roll that to production, and then I can decide, okay, now flip the router over, and if anything fails, flip it right back. So that concept of being able to go back and forth is huge. It does mean you have to have double the resources, right? You have to have at least two chunks of memory and a CPU available to run these two workloads. Uh, these are very, very lightweight Node.js work workloads in this case. But it does mean you're now protected should anything fail, OK? You can go back to the previous one. So we have a lot of content on blue-green deployment. But let's kind of let's go ahead and run this guy here, OK? So I got those two guys out there. Uh, we're curling. We can go in there and you can go check them out. But let's go ahead and patch our service. What I'm going to do is update, remember our describe service? See the selector says app my node right here? We're going to just patch that. Oh, I didn't want to co copy that. All right, we're just going to patch that. And now it's bonjour. OK? If I go look at my describe again, app my node new. OK? If I come back here and patch it again, that's my green. Let's say I didn't really want French. I can go back to hello. So your marketing department might say, you rolled that out too fast. I didn't want that bonjour thing in production. Say, like, fine, it's gone. It takes about that level of effort. So the blue-green deployment is something I want everyone to be practicing, because in Kubernetes, at least, it is incredibly simple. OK? It is super easy. If you had big IP F5 routers, you could do this sort of thing. If you had some really fancy skills with HA proxy, Nginx, and all those things, you could do it also. But in this case, it's just kind of built into the architecture. All you got to do is flip your match, your label selector to whatever new set of labels you want. OK? Uh, to kind of make that point a little bit more, though, the concept of the label selector, let's see if I can do this real quick. Because uh, this is actually something I set up last night thinking it'd be fun to show people. Uh, is it test? Yeah. Cube, CTL, get pods. I have a, a Go, a Node, and a Python all running here. OK? And I have a service. A single service running on um, that uh, port right there, so 199.102.2 and 32.058.8. All right, there we go. So notice it's going between Node and Python and Python and Python and Node. Seems to like those two a lot. And Go. It's load balancing across all three of those right now. And so it doesn't care what the pod is implemented as. It's just routing traffic accordingly. And the trick to it is cube cuddle get services. There's the service. Cube cuddle describe service, my service. Look at the load. It basically says the selector is app, my pods. And you notice you see in Kubernetes land, people use app equal a lot. It just, but it's an arbitrary string. You could call it burr equals sutter. You could call it you know, devox equal cool. It doesn't matter what the string is, as long as you know what it is. And it says app my pods. And I say cube cuddle. Get pods, show labels. All right, and you can see app my pods. So as long as the pod has, carries the label, it shows up inside the load balancer. That is the magic of the service. And even if it is completely different implementations, Go code, Node.js code, or Python code in this case, uh, and all these are part of this project, you know, the GitHub project that I've kind of set up for you guys here. So if we look here, right, you can kind of see there's a Go example. A microprofile example, Node.js, Python, Spring Boot, Spring Boot with Fabricate, Spring Boot with a Jib, and there's a Vertex one also, right? Because it doesn't matter what the payload is, all these same properties apply. That is kind of the awesomeness of Kubernetes. It used to be that only Java people could play in this category, they had all these awesome tools. Now everybody can play in this category, okay? All right, so that's kind of your, your built in, uh, sorry, your blue green deployment. There is the concept of the built in canary. And I'm trying to decide, I don't want to run, we're going to skip running it for now because it is kind of involved and it works kind of oddly. And it's related to the readiness probe that I showed you earlier. So in this case, you can see it's all documented. You can go into the health method and actually add something really bad into it, like system exit. <laughs> okay? Something you should never add. But let's say a really bad programmer was hacking away and really pissed off. As a matter of fact, they quit today, but they're checked that code in and it's rolling through the automated deployment pipeline. And because you guys are all awesome with blue-green deployments and a fully automated practicing you know, CI, CD, it literally will go into production as they walk out the door. 
Let's say you have that level of automation right in production. It still won't actually deploy because the health and readiness probes are just going to say, you know what? I'm going to try to rolling update you. If it can't pass the health, health probe here and system that acts, it won't. It basically won't deploy you. You'll see it continually trying to deploy, but it won't deploy. Okay, so that concept is a lot of people refer to it as a canary deployment within the context of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is looking at the liveness probe and readiness probe to try to get your pod to start. If at any given point it won't start, it just won't turn the load balancer over to you. So a lot of people do think of it as a basic canary deployment. We'll show you a much more interesting canary deployment in Istio, though. Right. So that's kind of the basics of what you get out of the box with with Kubernetes by default. Okay. Uh, and then you kind of just you know have a lot of fun with it. You kind of see you'll see crash loop back off things like that, uh, and just kind of hack on it and have fun. There's also the ability to have mini deployments. You, in the case of blue green, I had a deployment for blue, a deployment for green. You can also deploy a canary deployment if you will, a little bit different from that. And again, you're just patching the um, you're just patching the deployment so that it applies the appropriate labels. Pretty straightforward stuff. Okay. All that is certainly part of, part of this world. But in the case, Istio makes this vastly more interesting, vastly easier, and, uh, and much, more, much more powerful. Let's kind of double check all this. OK. All right, we showed you that. Blue, green, walked you through that. Again, it's all documented. You guys have homework. Now, the new step nine is databases. The old step nine was debugging. Debugging is relatively straightforward, assuming you get the right port to open up. You just got to open up the, the right port for J, uh, Java debugging, and then you're fine. OK? Uh, and the Fabricate Maven plugin actually has Fabricate, so Maven Fabricate colon deploy for deployment, and Maven Fabricate colon debug for setting up that same pod, restarting it with the debug port open. Uh, it doesn't always work consistently for me, though, and I'll tell you that. And oddly enough, this is a, a Red Hat tool, right? So I know the guy who works on it. I haven't had enough time to sit down and pound on it to figure out why it doesn't always work for me consistently and spend time with the engineer on that topic. But there's the, the thing that came back from all my classes where people were very curious about databases. OK? How do I run a database as a pod? How do I run a database in this nice ephemeral, you know, this cool cloud native way under Kubernetes? And the good news is Kubernetes was always built from the get-go to think about this use case. So unlike 12 factor, you could still be cloud native and stateful. You don't have to be stateless. It just had to have the right infrastructure to manage state. OK? And so database runs perfectly fine inside Kubernetes as long as you know how to treat it properly. And so there's actually a team out there called CrunchyDB that does a lot in this space that basically makes Postgres run as a uh, Kubernetes native thing. You basically have these four steps you should think about. You notice the latter two are the ones you're already familiar with, right? You have to have a deployment and you have to have a service. No big deal there. The thing that's unique now is you have to have a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim. That's the two additional things. So if you want to talk to the file system inside your application, or in this case, a database talking to the file system, you have to have a PVC, or persistent volume claim, meaning you're telling Kubernetes, I need persistent storage and a volume that lives and breathes forevermore and is not ephemeral. Because by default, if you just start writing to the local file system inside your container, you're writing to the local file system in that container. And when you saw how I was killing those pods so often, you would have lost all that data. In the container, local file system, one, you're going to run out of space, and two, it gets recycled all the time. That is the point of the pod. The pod comes and goes all the time. If you want something external to the pod, separate from the pod, PVC, PV. All right? So the PV is typically set up by your systems administrator. They're going to say, OK, I'm running Ceph or Gluster or NFS or whatever file system that they want inside their, inside their data center, inside their cluster. And then the PV basically identifies what those volumes are. And the PVC is, I want one now. And therefore, if my pod comes up, it lays claim to it. If it's available, and then once it's available, you can start writing to it. OK? So if we look at the database example, I'll just walk you through that just briefly. I already have it up and running. All right, you have this concept of the persistent volume and persistent volume claim. Let's see, where did I leave that guy here? I have these things in demo, I think. Dun, 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 cube get all. OK, yep. So I, basically what I have here is I have Postgres running as a pod, as well as a little application talking to that Postgres. OK, so you see there's a Postgres pod and a My Spring Boot pod that actually speaks through, you know, speaks into it. That actually talks to it. No big deal there. Now, notice the PV and the PVC don't show up here. They kind of just don't really have a namespace associated with them. So get PV. 
All right, there's the Postgres PV that was created. Uh, notice that it's been claimed by Postgres PVC and cube cuddle get PVC. All right, there it is. Okay, and Postgres PV. That's basically how it's mounted. So if we go and look at the code for this, all right, well, let's bring up the, the, the Java code is pretty straightforward. Nothing unusual here. You know, pretty standard stuff. And actually, I picked this up from another blog. But look at the resources. That's part that's interesting. I have a local properties where it has to talk to a local host, Postgres. But the regular application properties talks to a Postgres process. See, see the difference there? Local host versus Postgres. And the only real distinction is that there is a service. And you meant, we meant get services called Postgres. So that service discovery we mentioned earlier still works even if it's not a, what you think of as a normal pod, what we showed you so far. It doesn't have to be a Java and Node.js app. It could be a database. It doesn't matter, OK? So Postgres is named a service. And I'm basically saying connect to that in my application.properties file. And you can kind of see I have a user ID and password. This is all pretty kind of just hacked up kind of thing. But it's pretty straightforward. Here's my Docker file. Nothing weird there. The, you know, we've seen that before. Um, and then what we want to do is deploy that application. We've already deployed it. OK, so let's actually bring this up and show you what that deployment looks like. So my boot data, where to go? Here's the deployment. And you can kind of see what it's set up there. OK, my boot deployment. But let's look at the Postgres deployment right here. And see, this one actually has a bunch of things in it. it basically, it defines the database, the user and uh, password. Again, you could have those externalized in a config map or something of that nature. Uh, but basically, look here. It basically maps this Postgres PVC to the PVC, the per persistent volume claim. So that concept of basically saying, I need Kubernetes. I need access to disk. Kubernetes is like, OK, let me see if I find available disk. Ah, you got it. We give it to you. Otherwise, your pod won't start. OK? Your pod will fail if it should try to start. If it says, I need disk, Kubernetes doesn't have any disk to give it, you don't get it. Uh, so that's, it's just like what you saw earlier with other resources, except in this case, it is a volume. OK? So that's what I did is I did the Postgres deployment. So we did the Docker pull. We looked at the PVs. We ran the Postgres PV. We ran the Postgres PVC. Notice you can see when you first build the per, uh, persistent volume, there's no claim to it. As soon as you add the PVC, there is now a claim to it. OK? You kind of see the magic is specifically the storage class. That's how it knows what to map. So if I go over here to the PV, storage class my storage, PVC, storage class my storage. So whenever you're creating a PVC, you simply just have to have the right storage class identifier. Again, typically a systems administrative person will actually figure this out. And then you can kind of see how it maps in. Uh, this took me a little while to figure out, by the way. I was like, I can't quite figure out how to map it properly. Um, but you can kind of see with the uh, PV, in the case of Minikube, I'm mapping it to data, slash data, and my Postgres data. And actually, I'm curious about something here. Uh, this is something I forgot to check last night uh, when I was playing around with this some more. Uh, my Postgres data. Oh, uh, dun, 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 uh, I. All right. Let me in there. Oh, am I in the wrong directory again? OK, data. Uh, my Postgres data. All right, there's my Postgres. Right? If you're familiar with Postgres, you're like, yeah, that looks like a Postgres. That's the files it drops out there on the file system. Uh, so literally, basically, as my Postgres is up and running, it is now talking to that local piece of disk. And that piece of disk is guaranteed to be available based on my systems administrator setting up the right volumes. OK? But again, Ceph, Cluster, all kinds of different options in the storage space. Your cloud provider, if you deploy on a Kubernetes provided by an Amazon or Google, et cetera, et cetera, they're also going to tell you what the storage volumes ought to be. Uh, if you look at you know, something from the Google team, they will show you exactly. They'll tell you, here's this command. Here's how you mount the volume. And then you just have to have the right PVC to access it. OK? So it's pretty straightforward once you get the, the rhythm of it. No big deal there. Uh, OK, let's do this. Kind of show you a couple of things here. Kubectl get pods. There's my Postgres pod. Kind of show you it is a real live running Postgres. Kubectl port forward. And it's 5432. We're going to map 5432 out 
So the port forward is a very powerful tool, one that you should be aware of. Basically, it means that the port within the pod is now visible at localhost. So if, I do this, if I've done this correctly, and I don't know if I have or not, we'll find out, um, I should be able to get to it using pgadmin. Let's see. Databases. My database. Schemas. So this is the database that's living underneath that Java application. And using Hibernate, right? Um, it's using Hibernate Creator Update. Is this the one? I've lost track of where I left that one. Let's leave here. Uh, exit. Go here. I use that code trick a lot. You notice? OK, so application properties, hybrid eight, post SQL dialect, uh, DDL, update. OK, so that's how we got the schema there to begin with. And you kind of see there's this schema right here. And if I come over and say tools, query tool, I don't know if I have any records. Let's see. Select bat from questions. Go away. There. All right, so I do have one little question in there. OK, so there's the whole Java application talking to its Postgres database, with the Postgres database being you know, mapped to disk that is now available in Kubernetes. So stateful applications, not a problem. You just have to make sure that the application is you know, set up accordingly. Uh, in this case, Postgres is something that people are running in production now on Kubernetes backbones. The team, the team that we work with a lot is called CrunchyDB. I don't know if I have their icon here. Maybe I do. Yeah, these guys. Uh, they're kind of the enterprise Postgres SQL folks that basically work to optimize it on a Kubernetes backend. Uh, in this case, though, I'm just using a standard Postgres that I downloaded from Docker Hub. So no big deal there. If I look at the deployment for that, see if I can figure out where my deployments went. So if I look at the deployment for Postgres, where's the image name? Yeah, so the image name is just Postgres 10.5. That's basically one thing I just downloaded from Docker Hub. GitHub images, grep, Postgres. OK, so 10.5 was pulled from Docker Hub. So it's not, nothing unusual about it, uh, but it has been kind of configured now to work this way. OK, a couple, make sure, let's double check a couple things here. Yeah, connect to it, no problem. Uh, you also have access to PL SQL inside it. That's an important thing to know, too. Pods, exec, IT. And then they the pod identifier and p sequel. Okay, but it, you got to have the right p sequel command right here. There's two environment variables. Those environment variables you saw earlier in the deployment definition. There we go. So you now there's my databases associated with Postgres. So you can actually get inside that. Now, why would you do this? Um, sorry, let's quit. Is it quit? No. Q. There it is. <laughs> the, um, why would you do this sort of thing? I don't know about you guys, but I've, when I develop an application, and often uh, most applications talk to relational database, so ever, I know not everyone's gone to Mongo yet, right? Or Redis. Most people still use a relational database with you know, select, splat, that kind of thing. What happens is the database that one developer has is sometimes unique for that developer, right? They, they have their Postgres on their laptop. You have your Postgres on your laptop. They have another Postgres on their laptop. The schemas might be different, but certainly the data inside it is different, right? The anonymized data you pulled out of production and you dropped off for developers to use. You know, if you've, you've run a bunch of tests and things like that, and now the data is slightly different. In this case, I can actually have in a team cluster, a server, where everybody can talk to that same Postgres if I want. Or even if I'm running my own local cluster, or my own namespace, I can at least use the same exact uh, image associated with that Postgres or MySQL or whatever it might be, whatever database. Uh, at this point, you, could shoot, you should be able to use SQL Server this way too. SQL Server runs on Linux. I, and then I can pull it in and I can interact with it, right? In other words, I don't have to set up Postgres on my machine anymore or MySQL on my machine anymore or SQL Server or whatever on my machine. I can basically have it running in the cluster. So there is that kind of win from a developer standpoint to basically have that concept of a database to interact with. Again, I think I documented all this pretty well. OK, if you want to check that out. So it does have a little endpoint available to it. Get pods, right? So my boot right there. So kubectl get, get services. And this is all part of the application that you have to play with, right? So curl 192, 168, 99, 102. And 32150 slash questions. All right, so this talks about me not walking my dog. I need to walk my dog on a regular basis. She's about 
20 pounds, has rather short legs. So it's a question and answer, a simple little application, <laughs> right? How to get help for things. So that walks you through all of that, okay? Oh, there's one thing at the very end here I should mention. The world in Kubernetes is moving to this thing called operators. So this document walks you through everything, again, fully manual, work, should work on any kind of Kubernetes environment, but there's a new concept called an operator. An operator is a different kind of deployment, a different kind of controller. So you're going to hear the term controller a lot in this world. And what it does is the operator has intelligence in it, and the operator can be based on typically three different things. One, it's all Go code, all written in Go. Therefore, that's probably not something you want to try as a developer, you know, unless you're really interested in learning Go. Um, and it uses the Kubernetes API directly. But it's typically written in Go code, or it might be an Ansible playbook or a Helm chart. Those are another two common ways to build an operator. But the operator has intelligence inside it to not only deploy everything correctly, like make sure the PV and the PVC and all that are right and ready to go, but if you do a rolling update of Postgres itself, go from 10.5 to 10.6, the operator can ensure that you have zero downtime in that. Or if you want to clone a database, a production database, that's another thing that the operator would have. So the operator, if you think about it, is really taking the place of a human operations person. It's trying to apply intelligence at scale across the cluster. So if you have 14 different Postgres databases and they all need to move from 10.5 to 10.6, the operator can help you do that. Right, that's kind of the crunchy DB, crunchy DB operator, um, and you're, so you're going to hear a lot more about operators. For instance, the Istio installation I have running right now was deployed via an operator, and that's the first time I've deployed Istio via operator, like in the last week. Um, so operators are very new, and you're seeing them applied to everything now. So, like, um, uh, if you're interested in Kafka. Running Kafka in Kubernetes, there's a project out there that gives you an operator, right, called StremZ. It gives you the operator to basically deploy Kafka at scale, and it knows how to do things like ensure we have Zookeeper running, ensure we have Kafka running, we have to have three of each, right, production ready, uh, and, in, and again, if you have to do an update, it has update logic built in too. That's kind of neat. So same techniques you saw, everything done manually, but the operator kind of does it more um, in an automated fashion. So just be aware that operators are kind of coming, okay? All right, so we still have a few minutes left. You guys are probably thinking, really? I'm, let me see, let's check the raffle here and see if anyone actually is responding to our raffle. Oh, there's a, oh, look at that. Okay, so this is not the contest yet. Let's see if, who, who would be the winner here. Okay, fantastic. So that looks like it meets the criteria. We'll come back to that in a second. So we do have a few of you now in the raffle. All right, so hope a number of you there, fantastic. We're gonna give away the two Chromebooks in a second, but we have a few minutes left, okay? couple other things to show you in the bonus category. And I'm moving rather fast, I realize that, but we're trying to show you as much as possible. Let's walk through, through a little bit of Istio. There's a deeper dive session on Istio with Ray Singh, I think later today. No, he's doing Kane Native later today. I forget who's doing Istio. Maybe he's doing Istio tomorrow. Um, I don't have Kane Native running right now, but we could show you a little bit of that. Knative is kind of the thing that comes next after Istio. But Istio also is another Greek nautical term that means sail. So you hear all these Greek terms within the Kubernetes ecosystem. Sail and Istio is one of them. Uh, there's a great online learning experience that my team has been working on. So if you don't want to install anything, but you want to put your hands on Istio, you can go to learn.umship.com slash service mesh and try it. Just try the things I'm going to show you right now. Uh, we also have a full GitHub tutorial, Git, uh, Istio tutorial, where uh, much like you see all the nine steps code uh, examples, this is even better because it's not just me by myself, it's a whole team of people working on the tutorial, and it's basically a huge book to walk you through all the different Istio use cases that we can think of, uh, and we continue to add to it all the time. We've been working on it now for a solid year, so do check those out. The concept of the service mesh, though, is very powerful. The service mesh is a piece of infrastructure that sits on top of Kubernetes. You guys have now seen most of the awesomeness of Kubernetes, right? With the deployment and the service, the fact that pods are separate from the service, the deployment makes a declarative understanding of what should be run and makes everything run. You got rolling updates, you can do blue-green deployments, you can do all this awesome stuff, right? Kubernetes by itself is awesome. But what if I add Istio to it? And so Istio allows me to do some really clever routing logic as one example, and it also gives me some other things out of the box like distributed tracing and other telemetry information. I showed you this earlier. Okay, so here's my Grafana running over here, running against my application. And I had Jaeger running over here. I can look at the tracing. You know, so there's things that come out of the box and that are kind of neat already. So and I, let me flip, flip over here. And so let's start by Polar again. Okay, 
So I'm going to just run you through a quick demo of Istio, and that way you get a feel for some of the capabilities. But again, if you want to try it, it is a bit of a bear. This is fairly advanced. Just get, keep that in mind. If you're not comfortable with Kubernetes yet, you got to get comfortable with Kubernetes, and then you can add Istio to it, because Istio is advanced. All right? But it gives you some advanced capabilities. You can, I mentioned earlier, you can run all these exercises that I'll show you some quick examples of without having to install anything, though. Uh, and so you can launch it here. OK? So let's do this. Yeah, yeah, let's do this. All right? I got my little simple application, customer preference recommendation. Let's, let's kind of show you what that is again real quick. Uh, Shift dashboard. I'm going to just bring up the console here. And this is running. There's Istio system. You can see Istio system is running. This is just Istio itself. Okay. The key pieces to it are pilot, which is where you identify your rules and set up your route rules and things like that. There's the. Um, there's also two components which make up the telemetry thing. The Jaeger collector, Elasticsearch has to work for that one. Grafana is obviously part of the telemetry capture as well. But there is two others, uh, StatsD uh, and tel Telemetry. So these two components right here are collecting data, OK? And this other guy here, Pilot, is more like pushing data into the service mesh. Now, let's show you how this is set up, get pods. OK, let me get into the right namespace, OC project tutorial. All right, now I can do cube cuddle get pods. Notice here it has two by two. OK, that's one thing that's already distinct about this before. I have, I've shown you lots of pods already running, but they're always one by one. And that's because there's a sidecar container running in these guys. So if I describe pod and describe it, let's look here. There's some additional goodies inside this guy here. Let's see if we can find it. Look at this. So this, there's this Istio meta pod name. Where'd that come from? You know, there's a stats uh, address. Zipkin, these are not things I put in my code, okay? These are not, my deployment YAMLs are just like what you expect to see. This is new stuff. Envoy is the binary to the Istio proxy. So when you basically set up for Istio, you get this additional sidecar bolt-on added as another container alongside your container. And what it does is it manipulates IP tables to intercept all inbound and outbound traffic, network traffic. And you might be thinking, why would you want to do that? Well, there's some really crazy stuff you can do. One is you can log everything and capture all the telemetry data, get all the tracing data, and you get all that for free. And, and that's what I was showing you with those uh, Jaeger and Grafana user interfaces. OK, right? So you get this stuff now. See, there we got it. We're getting our tracing based on my polar. You know, we got some interesting stuff there. We should be getting all non 500s, right? We're 100% uptime. That's good, right? I can see how long different traces take. Uh, and there's other tools. There's another tool that I don't have running right now. Uh, that you can interact with called Kiali that we've been working on. So the service graph, you can, exact, you can kind of see where all the transactions are going and how they're performing. So you get that stuff kind of just out of the box by having the, the sidecar injected properly. But then you can do some fun stuff with it. Okay, so let's do this. And I think I call this one example. All right, so I have recommendation V1, preference V1, customer latest. And let's go here. Let's look at the application for recommendation. Here's my code. And let's just make this real obvious. Let's call this v2 uh, devox. Make it big and obvious, all right? I'm also going to change the logger. Where's the logging data? Here we go. Devox. All right, just make those changes. This is a little vertex application, by the way. You kind of see it has a declarative router, basically sets up like Node.js. If you're familiar with the Node.js programming model, then you'll really like vertex, but it runs on the JVM. Uh, it's a reactive framework for the uh, reactive toolkit for the JVM. Really awesome thing, and it's lightning fast. That's what I like about it. So Maven uh, clean package. Let's compile that guy. So ultra lightweight, ultra fast. So there we go, compile, compile, compile. OK. We should get a fat jar. There we go, Java dash jar. Target, recommendation. All right, our server is already up. Localhost, 8080. There we go, so v2 devox. So that's going to be my new code change. I want to push this into my production environment now. So Docker images, I showed you this earlier. Let's double check it real quick, example. OK, so I don't have a v2, so it's docker build dash t. Nine steps, awesome. Uh, recommendation. 
V2. We're going to do our Docker image build there. Whoop, did I do something wrong? Uh, what did I type? Docker built. You guys didn't catch that typo? Come on now. There's only a few hundred of you here. Someone should have caught that typo. All right, so docker run dash it dash p 80 80 80 80 uh, example. I just want to double check it this way too. You notice I do that, right? I try to run it local, local, uh, normal local host, and I also run it from the Docker daemon um, uh, recommendation just to be sure that I did make the change that I think I made. All right, there we go. Does not accept and then a recommendation v2. What did I misspell? Oh, is that what I called it? Oh, man, that's from the other thing. So it's a nine steps. Yeah, I did do that. All right, we can, we can make that work. <laughs> uh, let's go fix this real quick. This is why you check. See? Exactly why. Because now I've messed things up. We'll have to go fix it. All right. Uh, but uh, let's see here. The mini shift. I switched gears, right? I switched over to mini shift and it kind of stormed me off a little bit. Um, now we're going to curl this one. Okay. And, and uh, t -t -t actually, we don't have a service for it yet, uh, but this will work. Okay. Uh, 80, 80. All right. So there it is. All right, so there it is running as a Docker container. And so I now need to run this as a new deployment, OK? kubectl get deployments. Kind of like I showed you earlier with the blue versus green, I want to set this up as another deployable entity, OK? And let me make sure I do that right. And this is, again, all documented. So I'm going to just go pick it up out of the documentation so I get it exactly right. So again, we try to document everything. So let's go here. Dun, dun. And this is setting up for simple routing. Create the V2 a recommendation. Uh, and you notice I have this deployment YAML out here that I'm going to interact with. But I did, I did mess up the name of the image. So we're going to go fix that real quick. Let's do this. You can see there's all these different aspects of what Istio will let you do, like rate limiting, policy enforcement, you know, things of that nature. But what I want to do is not the Istio files. Let's go into recommendation. Let's go into Kubernetes. And this is deployment v2. OK. And where's the image name? Right here, nine steps. All right, so yeah, we got that right now. So that's the deployment I'm going to use to get a second deployment out there. So right now I have, I have the deployment of customer preference v1, recommendation v, uh, and recommendation v1. I need to get a deployment for recommendation v2, recommendation v2, OK? Uh, and I'm going to manually do the, the Istio inject. So let's do this one. All right, no such file. Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. Wait. All right. Recommendation. Here we go. All right. There. And we don't need these anymore. Okay. Hacking away here. Like we go, going crazy. QCDL get pods. All right, we've got a recommendation v2 coming online. Notice it says one of two, because only one of those containers is ready. It has to have both containers ready before it's part of the a good thing here. Come on, come on, two of two. Two of two, two of two. And notice already it's part of our, it has the proper label, so it's already uh, part of our load balancer. So you kind of get that for free, right? We showed you that already. If you deploy a pod and behind a service, it's automatically part of the load balancer. But let's have a little fun with it now. I, don't, I want everything to be version 1, OK? So even though I've deployed it, I don't want any of my users to see it. So it's still out there. So I've now basically deployed this Canary deployment, but no user can see it. It's still running. So this is a little bit like your blue-green deployment, but now you can get a little more sophisticated. In the case of blue-green or Canary, the old school way, in, I had 50-50 load balancing because they have two pods. If I have four pods, I get 25, 25, 25, 25. That's just what you get out of the box for free. In the case of Istio, you can actually say 1% goes to the new pod. Okay? In this case, we'll say 25% goes to the new pod. You can pick your percentage 
approximately, and it's a rad, it's a random allocation. You can pick your percentage regardless of your pod count. So that's one thing that's over and above and unique about what Istio provides out of the box, as an example. And if I again, if my marketing team says, nope, we don't want that, go back to version one only, I can run a script and I'm back to version one. So it's still running the pod out there, and it's kind of cool, but you can kind of basically see how, how much you want to change it. Also, I can do this thing here, like basically map it to Safari, okay? So uh, let's see here, cat, poll. I want to get my, let's do this, okay? So mini shift IP. I want to see what that is. All right, so I should be able to do this, curl. And, uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. oh, wait, I already have this thing running. Or, I mean, I've already loaded in the browser. Let's go over here and look real quick. All right. Yeah, okay, so this is version one here on Firefox. And where's my Safari at? We've showed you this little demo earlier, but let's show you this one now. Here's my Safari in this V2. Okay, so this is an important point, and we won't have a lot more time left, but the concept is I can now deploy a Canary deployment and only a certain subset of users can see it. You can use the HTTP headers to determine who sees what pod, and that's another component of Istio as well. So there's a lot more capability that we don't have time to show you. Istio by itself can take three hours of a presentation like the one you just saw, but this concept meaning I can basically say only logged in users see the new version. Only beta testers see the new version. Only users running in New Zealand or Canada see the new version. Because you can pick whatever HTTP header that you can set and decide exactly how to route traffic based on that. So that's, again, something that we didn't have in base Kubernetes that we now have something like Istio, in addition to telemetry setting, circuit breaking, right, uh, all kinds of other things that you see within the context of Istio. Okay? We are going to run out of time, though. So just be aware that you have those uh, links in this document, right? Istio tutorial, Istio intro, that walks you through the Istio capability. There's a presentation on Knative later. I highly encourage you to check it out because it kind of goes even to the next level, right, where it brings serverless capabilities to this Kubernetes cluster of yours, which is kind of awesome. There's also the Eclipse Che project that is basically a Kubernetes native IDE running in Kubernetes, and therefore you don't have to install anything on your laptop. All you have to do is have a browser because the whole IDE runs inside the browser, runs inside a Kubernetes pod, and as you interact with it, including going into the terminal, you're interacting with the Linux machine on the Kubernetes cluster. So it's a pretty powerful thing, and that's why I have these Chromebooks to give away. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. I have two Chromebooks to give away. We're gonna basically see what this result, what kind of returns show up. So I'm gonna basically say limit to two results for DevOps and Burr, and these are our two winners. Let's look here. All right. Let's see. Does it, yep, okay. Got a nice image there. You didn't have to say nice things, by the way. I was, you can say horrible things, too. All right, fantastic. All right, those are our two winners. So if those are your two IDs, we are out of time. But I'm available for uh, questions after the session. I'll be here the rest of the afternoon. I got to go help get some stuff head up, set up with Red Hat. Uh, if you have other things you want to see from me, though, feel free to let me know. I'm always interested in your feedback. Please do use the application to rate this session and say, this guy talks too fast, or I didn't understand anything he said, or I can't believe I wasted three hours this morning. But in a minimum, hopefully I got you pumped up and ready for DevOps. Is that cool? Thank you.